What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? And welcome to another very interesting and very important section in our amazing course. And in this section, after a lot of you guys asked for it, um, we are going to strength our knowledge and understanding of the core Git concepts. I'm going to show you visually how the files are being moved from one place to another while working with different Git commands. And these are going to be things that are actually pretty difficult to like to understand deeply without using these visualizations I'm about to share with you right now in this section. So although you've seen some of these concepts that I'm about to talk right now, uh, you've seen some of them pretty much in code, um, but these concepts actually could and should be explained even further to take your understanding to a whole new level. So some terminologies and visualizations that I'm about to share with you regarding similar things that we are, we've already talked about, but still required, uh, will simply be covered in more depth and with additional explanation. And of course, there is also additional information that you are going to get from almost, I think, yeah, from almost every video. So trust me that it, this section, it won't be like a waste of your time, but rather it will simply improve your knowledge, improve your skills and provide you with all the confidence you need to get start and like to even proceed working with Git. So guys, I hope you are ready. Stay tuned and here we go. All righty. So Git local workflow diagram. So first of all, what I want us to do is to talk about the Git local workflow diagram. And the reason as to why I would like to do that is because I think that by understanding the basic workflow of Git, like to take this understanding and to take it to its fullest, okay, it will make your life much easier later on in this course and also when you are going to work on different projects on your own with your team, it doesn't really matter. So it's essential to know like this workflow to its fullest uh, for the beginner sections, for the beginner knowledge and also uh, to understand it as the basis for more advanced commands and more advanced topics and more advanced sections that hopefully some of them will also be covered in this course. So that's why I recommend you to stay very, very focused on this section, pay extra attention to everything explained and discussed here and write down all relevant notes for yourself. I will also try to make some cheat sheet or some summarized uh, paper of all the commands and everything necessary so uh, so that it will be even easier for you. But still, uh, do your best also writing down notes and writing down the commands and the concepts uh, as how you see them, as how you understand them. It's all, it also improves your understanding and uh, the whole studying process is also getting improved. And I think that um, let's just say that with all that be was said right now, let us take a look at the following diagram. And right afterward, uh, we will talk about how a file can be moved. Okay, how one file can be moved from one place to another place in the workflow uh, diagram by using different Git commands. So there is a lot of things that we need to cover. And I think that let's just dive right into it, shall we? Awesome. So let's begin. So here it is and let's go. Okay. So <clears throat> first of all, I like to, I would like to explain this topic 
by dividing the possible states of any given file in our working directory into five main states. Although <laughs> some of the guru experts uh, which are out there may not, may not totally agree with me on this one, um, okay, but they may not agree that why am I dividing uh, this whole um, diagram into five main states? Uh, some of them may say let's divide it to less states, to more states, but I think that um, that is by far the best way to explain uh, the Git workflow, especially for beginners and for those who want to get everything straight to the point. So what we are going to do is to take some file, okay, let's just take some file and discuss all of its possible states that it can be in during our working process. In the first state, okay, let's say that the first state will be called untracked by git, which simply refers to, to a state of a file that is simply not tracked by git. So there may be a lot of files that are simply not tracked by git. They are going to be in our directory, but still the fact that some files are actually located under our directory, it does not necessarily mean, okay, I hope you remember this much, it does not necessarily mean that Git is going to track this file, right? Because we specify what exact files Git should track and some files are simply untracked by Git. That's okay, okay? So that's step and step, state, state number one. And the second state, as you may have guessed by now, is called simply tracked by git, okay, tracked and also let's say in the parentheses it's tracked but not changed. So at this state the file is already being tracked by the git system but it hasn't been changed since some occasion, okay, Sin since some something that has happened, okay? We will talk about it and explain soon enough all the details. So for now, we have two states. First state of a file, okay? We are talking about file states. The first state of a file is untracked by Git. The second state of a file is tracked by Git, but not changed. And the third state, okay, as I like to call it, is tracked by Git, and changed. So this file is being tracked by Git and it has changed since some occasion, okay? So in the second state it is tracked by Git but has not changed since something has happened and the third state is simply uh, the file is also being tracked by Git and it has changed, okay? So once again we will talk about this changed terminology right away, so no worries about that. Simply understand that we are talking about files state. And moving forward, we have the fourth state of a file, which is called staged, okay, in the staging area. Or as it's also called by others as like, you maybe heard it uh, from other teachers, maybe also in some of my videos, it also can be referred as index. So if you hear about staging area or index, don't panic. <laughs> First of all, don't panic. And simply remember that both of these things, these terminologies, which we are going to cover up in the next videos, uh, they are pretty much one and the same thing. So we've covered up also the fourth state of a file, which is staged or index in the staging area. And now we are going to talk about the fifth state of a file, which is called committed. This simply means that the data of the file has been added to your local Git database and it's now part of your Git repository, okay? So 
all of this data is now part of the Git repository and it simply means like I think that you can also t uh, look at this and terminology and understanding like that uh, a s there is a snapshot of your file content that has been taken and added to the tracked history. So I hope that's clear so far. Um, <clears throat> so we have five states, awesome. And in the following videos, we are going to talk in depth about each of these states, as well as what Git commands are being used to move a file from one state to another and what's actually is happening behind the scenes, okay? Awesome. So <clears throat> once again, we have a file. The file may be in a couple of states, right? There are some optional states that one file can be in. And we are going to discuss everything about the states, the commands, and so on. And one last thing before we move on, <clears throat> It's also very important for me to mention to you guys that there is a difference between the Git version control system, which is usually located under the .git directory, and the working directory we are currently working at. Okay, so there is a difference between a .git directory and the working directory. Okay, these are not entirely two different things, but there is a difference between them. And for some reason, a lot of people and a lot of students find it one and the same thing. And once again, while they do share some similarities, it's important to understand that the working directory can be thought of where all of your project is going to reside. And Git is a version control system in your project that's taking part in just keeping track of certain files in your working directory, okay? And not the entire project, like specific images, videos, and what else. There are other techniques to, to treat these kinds uh, of files, but that's not, not, not for this discussion. Simply understand uh, the difference between working directory and .git uh, directory and also understand that there may be files which are tracked, untracked and so on and so forth. So git again is just a tool for version control. It's a version control system that it use, uh, that it's that is <laughs> used to keep track of certain specific files in the working directory, which means, there may be also files in the working directory which are not tracked by Git, okay? So, uh, I I think I said... So, that's pretty much what I wanted to discuss with you in this video. And I think now we are ready to move on. All right, welcome back to another very, 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 very important and interesting video that we are going to talk about untracked state, okay? And this was actually the first state, uh, I think, in our workflow diagram. And <clears throat> in this video, let us talk about what is the main difference between tracked and untracked. So we know that we have our working directory and we also know that as part of this working directory we may have a lot of different files, right? And the first question that we are going to ask ourselves is which files will and also which files should be tracked by Git. And that's something that we are going to talk about in this video. So let's proceed and let's see our uh, workflow diagram <clears throat> and talk about some interesting situation. And it starts with a simple understanding that whenever you create some new file in your working directory, 
it's not necessarily going to be tracked by Git. And that's okay if you, I mean, that's okay if you deliberately did not want to track a certain file. But what about a new file that you want to track, but Git doesn't track it? So in this case, you will go and make some changes to the file. Okay, so for example, like you can see on the screen, we have some new file. Uh, so you've done some changes, you've made some revisions and so on. And <clears throat> you've done all of this work and all of this process while the file was not even being tracked. Okay, so in this case, none of these changes that you've done to the file will be documented because I mean that makes sense right because uh, git does not track it so how can we track the changes and that's to be honest not something that you want to be happening during your development process so that's the first state of a file and it call it's called untracked by git <clears throat> and if we want to summarize then we can say that tracked files are files that Git knows about them and that Git is going to keep track of their versions, of their editions, and basically all the history of the file over time, while untracked files, Git is not going to do that. So that's a quick and simple explanation about the difference that you should also bear in mind. And to emphasize this visualization concept and understanding, uh, let's say that whenever you create a new file, for example, some hello world.py file with some content inside of it, okay, I'm just using the example from previous videos, um, just like we've done it with VI and we used to write some print hello world and whatever it was, okay, and we simply created a new file in our working directory. Okay, so we have created this file. And <clears throat> so basically, it was the first time. And if it was the first time, and it's probably going to be under the untracked by default state. And a very simple way to know, okay, and to see to see for yourself that uh, what is the status of a given file, you can simply use git status and you will see that this tool can determine which files are in which, in whatever states they are. So in this case, the newly added file is going to be listed under the untracked files section. So here it is, you can see it under the untracked files, you can see also uh, the files that are untracked by Git. And in this case, it's very simple. One file, it is untracked. And basically, every file you are going to add to your working directory, every new file is probably if you haven't configured something like, I don't know, some super configuration that should take care of it, it's first of all going to be in the untracked state and it will be listed by the git status command in the untracked files section. Awesome. So now the main question that comes is uh, if you would like to move a given file from being in an untracked state to some other state, then it's something we are going to talk about in the next video. All right, I'm going to show you this one. Uh, how this file, where is my list laser? Okay, come here. How we can take this file and to move it to different states and to change actually its state, to move it in our uh, Git workflow diagram, what commands should do what part and so on. And to summarize all of these things, um, what I can say is this much that not always you would like to track all of your files, okay? Depending also <clears throat> on your IDE, what you're developing and so on. And based on all of that, you may have to, to generate a lot of different files during various different processes of your development. And some of these files 
depending again on what environment you're using, what processes you're using, buildings, so on and so forth. Uh, so some of these files may be actually totally irrelevant to hold version because to hold their versions because um, for example they may only be suitable for your own specific environment but not for other environment okay so there may be uh, generated files that simply bear in mind that you don't have to keep track of them okay there is no reason to do so so there are files that shouldn't be tracked and it can be done if you don't explicitly specify to git that it should track them or if you use the dot ignore magic which i think we will we will also talk in the upcoming videos or we have already talked about it in some other videos which is simply a file that specifies what extensions of a file shouldn't be tracked okay i mean like what files shouldn't be tracked maybe directories that shouldn't be tracked and so on and so forth so that's very important guys um and i guess this is it for this video my name is vlad this is alpha tech and until next time have a great day so now that we know we've got some file that is not currently being tracked by git and we want git to start tracking it then we can explicitly tell git to do so and that's exactly what we are going to do in this video we are going to talk about how we can track new files using git so i hope you're ready it's not going to be a long video but let's start all right so <clears throat> how can you do it okay how can you tell git to track given file changes how to track different versions of a file how to start tracking an untracked file just like this hello world.py file that we just created and that's very simple just use the git add command to add the file that we you, you want to start tracking okay so hello world.py currently is in in un, is in a state of untracked and by using the git add and the file name uh, by using this command this will let git know that from this moment on unless of course otherwise will be specified this file this hello world.py file should be tracked so for the first time it will take the file from the untracked state and put it into the staged state that's the workflow of moving a file from untracked to staged by using the git add command and guys one important note is that please note that git add will be also used on files from other states okay so git add is not used only for taking files which were untracked and moving them into the staging area we'll see also additional examples where this one and the same command is going to to take a file from different states and put it in different states and <clears throat> if now you want to make sure that everything was uh, done smoothly so you can simply use the git status command and we will see that this file this hello world.py file is now being tracked by git and it's in the staged okay in the staged state ready to be committed and of course you can be sure that it's in the stage state uh since you can see here right on the screen let me take this laser come here since you can see here uh on the screen under um the section of changes to be committed uh and we remember that changes to be committed are actually done for files from the staged state okay so that's basically um what i have to tell you for um this information so 
Awesome, now you know how to explicitly tell Git to start tracking an untracked file. Great job, guys. And just to summarize, okay, if we will take a look at our workflow diagram, if we come back uh, for just a second to our five states diagram, then the new untracked file that was previously here, after using the git add command, is going to be moved from the first state to the fourth state, which called which is called the staged state. <laughs> so don't worry about uh, the second and the third states. Okay, we'll also talk about them in the next videos. Uh, for now, just understand the main flow of uh, the first time that you created a file and you used the git add command. And one last thing that I wanted to mention here is the fact that we can use the git add command to take and track an untracked file. And also it can be used to start tracking an untracked directory that you add to your project. So that's also okay. It may also be a file, it may be a bunch of files, it may also be a directory, and so on and so forth. That's also okay. So, <laughs> in this case, if you're working with a directory, this command takes a path, okay, a path name, also for a directory, and in this case, if it's a directory, it will also add all the files inside this directory, in kind of a recursive manner and start tracking all of these files too, okay? So that's also very important for you to know that you can work uh, and you can specify Git to track uh, files and also directories and everything inside of these directories. So I think this is it, all right guys? Don't forget to let me know what you think uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. And as we always say, keep on practicing, keep on learning new things, keep moving forward, and you are bound to succeed. I'll see you next time. My name is Vlad. This is Alpha Tech. Have a great day. All right. So at this point, we know how to track untracked files. And we also said that once we've used the git add uh, command on an untracked file, then right after using this command, it will be tracked by git from this point on, just like we've done it with our hello world.py file. And it's now at the staging area, okay? So we've seen also uh, a nice example just like this one. And as we said, um, it will be tracked from this point on by Git, unless otherwise, unless we use some other command, some explicit command to specify that this given file should not be tracked or maybe some pattern of files, some files with given extensions that they shouldn't be tracked. Okay, but uh, more about that in our future videos. Now let's talk, um, let's take a totally different file, okay? A file that has been already tracked by Git for some time, okay? This file is going to be called like goodnight.py. And all this file, just a quick reminder, all this file uh, simply does is just to print some goodnight message, nothing more, okay? So, once again, previously we talked about a new file, hello world.py, and now I want to show you additional example when where we take uh, a new file called a good night. Okay, actually it's not a new file, it's a file that uh, you or maybe some other developer has already been working on, making some additions and so on and so forth. And this file has been already tracked by Git for some time. And now we are going to take a look at what we can do with it. So for that, let's take a look at our previous workflow diagram, okay, with all the five states that a file can be in. 
And <clears throat> this file, this goodnight.py file, is going to be located under the unmodified state, okay? Then uh, basically we said that it's being tracked by Git and it's not changed, okay? Not changed since some scenario has happened. So first of all, what does it even mean that the file is located in this particular state? What do you think it means that a certain file, okay, goodnight.py, is in this unmodified state? Well, <clears throat> it simply means that this file, okay, has not been changed since our last commit, okay, since the last snapshot that we've taken of this file and put it as part of our repository. You remember how we talked about saving versions of our project by making specific snapshot of the project's files. So we know we have a file, okay? And we can say that it was not modified since the last snapshot, okay? So we had some snapshot and this file was not modified since then. That's why it's tracked by Git but not changed. Awesome. So now <clears throat> if you will use uh, the git status command, you will see that there is no relevant information specified by the git system regarding this file. Okay, so there is the new file, the hello world.py, but nothing about uh, the good night file. Okay, because nothing has been changed. Okay. Uh, the git status does not show any information about that so far. And you can see that simply by using the ls command, okay, to list the files. So ls basically shows you what files we have in this working directory. So there are two files and the git status does not show anything about the good night file. And that kind, uh, that kind to make sense, right? Because there is nothing interesting for Git regarding a file that was not modified, okay? So that's why the Git status works as it works, all right? And now <clears throat> what we are going to do is to modify the content of the file a little bit. Maybe if currently um, ju we just have like a message of print good night, then in this case, we will add just one line of code to this file and save it. Let's say uh, we add additional command and we call it like print um, and sweet dreams. So it will be good night and sweet dreams, <laughs> something like that, okay? I mean, why not? And in this case, once we modified the file, if we will use the git status command, you're going to see something like this, okay? So there will be the changes to be committed. That's something we discussed about the hello world.py. doesn't really matter for now. But you will see also uh, that our file now has <clears throat> moved from the unmodified state to the modified state. And Git tells us that this file is now located under the section called changed, not changes not staged for commit. Okay, and here you can see also the file of good night. And <clears throat> just to make it clear to you guys, uh, it simply means that Git has noticed that the tracked file was modified. That's why it has moved between the unmodified, between the unchanged, uh, to uh, between this state, the second state, to the third state, which is basically also tracked by Git, but changed, changed since the last commit, okay? So the content of the file has been changed. And if you wanted to add this modified file, okay, this modified file in this third state to the staging area, okay, to the stage area and take this file from the tracked by gate state, okay, uh, then basically what you should do <coughs> is simply to use some command. And what command should it be? 
let us take a look at our git workflow uh, at, at the code okay now we uh, we've seen the git workflow what we want to do now let's take a look at how this can be done using the commands so here we are at uh, our commands and <clears throat> in this case all we have to do is once again to use the git add command and specify the file name and it will take your modified file okay just like that it will take the modified file and put it inside the staging area it simply will change the state of this file <clears throat> so um now it will be ready to be committed and to be part of the following snapshot of the project which is pretty awesome right so git add goodnight.py will take the file put it in the staging area and it will now be ready for additional commit and <clears throat> I hope that everything is clear to you guys, okay, trying like to simplify everything as possible, okay. And one of the common questions students ask me um, at this point is, how can it be that the git add command is used for both moving a file from an untracked state to staging state and also from modified state to staging state and so on. So. How does Git knows? Uh, how does Git know the difference between the command? Because it seems to be pretty much the same command, but it does two different things, right? It takes a file from one state to another, and also from another state to the same state. Well, <clears throat> basically, it's it's just the same command, and it can be used for different situations and provide you with different functionalities and some some of that is based on the initial state uh, of the file that git add is applied to so basically just to to cut the not important thing uh, the git add is not really concerned at least at these two options that I've shown you is not really concerned uh, concerned from which state it's going to take the file but it's really important to what state it will take the file so it will take the file to the staging area and it's super important to understand this part precisely okay <clears throat> so i hope that's clear if you have any questions feel free to ask them and also feel free to leave some feedback and review on the material uh, you've learned so far it helps me a lot so Anyway, let's get back to where we left off um, <clears throat> and start uh, continue discussing our discussion. So we added the second file from the modified staging state, okay? And now if we are going to check the status of the files by using the git status command, then we will see that both of the files we've been talking about are now at the staging state okay you can see this mean uh, this means that both of them are in the staging state and they will be part of our next commit of our next snapshot so that's basically the main thing that I wanted to cover in this video I hope I've done it correctly I think I've done it right let me know <laughs> And <clears throat> that's how it looks like in our five states diagram. And I think that for this video, that's enough. You understand now in more depth how the git add command works, how the transition between different states of a file also looks like behind the scenes. And you're getting more prepared for your more advanced topics and your more advanced explanations. So thank you guys for watching. And as always, I will see you. Where should I see you? In the next video, I guess. <laughs> so until next time, have a great day or evening, whatever it is. I wish you best of luck. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? I hope you're doing well. 
and in this video we are going to expand our knowledge and talk about one interesting operation that we haven't spoke of probably until now. We are going to take a look at how we can take a file, okay, just a file, one of these, which is one step before the actual commit, one state before the actual commit, right, in the staging area. And we are going to modify the content of this file in the working directory, okay, so simply to modify its content and to understand what will actually happen in our five states diagram. So that's a very important video, stay focused because here we go, okay? It's very important to be very, very focused here. Okay, guys, I'm going to show you that although we've seen like a file can change from one state to another, we are going to see that something is not entirely true and there is no just one state for a file we can see that there may be times that we need like to think even further and to understand a little bit more about what's going on behind the scenes that's actually can can be considered to be a little bit advanced okay because um, this understanding that you are going to get in this video and I think that also in the next will let you understand things in more depth uh, and prepare you for more advanced commands and also for additional things that are not covered in this course but if you're working in a company or you will have your own complicated projects it may be of a great use to you so let's start and <clears throat> I think that we should start with um, a quick reminder okay let's call uh, let's recall our status um, git status um, <clears throat> that we've used so far and basically we have two files <clears throat> two files in um, the staging area okay we have two files in the staged area both of them got there from other states okay so one was uh, from untracked the second was from tracked and changed and not changed and so on and so forth everything that we've covered in the previous videos um, but never mind about it right now uh, because that's something we've covered until now but now we want to move a step further and what we want to check right now is <clears throat> what will happen before making any actual snapshots of the staged files right because now these files uh, these let's say um, contents of the files are now st staged and changes to be committed okay <clears throat> so what will happen if we decide to modify one of these files and let's say that we wanted to modify the second file this goodnight.py okay currently it has the content of print goodnight print and sweet dreams okay maybe we found some bug that we immediately needed to fix or any other minor change that we have to make or to add okay so in this case we take this file and let's say add one new line let's say we simply add to the file uh, some additional printing message of don't forget that you have to wake up tomorrow at 7 a.m. okay some additional printing message something like that nothing complicated and now <clears throat> once you've completed your changes this new line this addition of the new line the, um, <clears throat> has been made and the main question you should be asking yourselves at this point is what will happen to the file itself okay how is git going to treat and th and see this file will the file in the staging area be modified okay with this new content or maybe some other file will get modified so what do you think guys take a couple of moments think about the solution and try to come up with a reasonable explanation 
into like don't don't pause this this video for at least two three minutes think about it what will happen we have a file in the staging area this good night that be it has a, it had a previous content of that was like this now we added this new line print tomorrow 7 a.m what will happen what will happen how git system okay our git version control system how is it going to look at this particular um situation that happened will the file in this staging area in this index will it be changed will something else be changed maybe we haven't specified everything so far so take a couple of moments and once you're done let's proceed <clears throat> so to answer this let's simply take uh, another look at our code so previously we used the git status and that's what it showed us now after this step we've modified the file <clears throat> and now we use git status once again after modifying the file okay we, e either it was using notepad or vim or whatever atom doesn't really matter right but <clears throat> what's interesting for us uh, to see right now is this git status command this simply tells us how git sees the changes we've just made okay and what we can see here is very very strange okay i mean previously the git status in this video and also a video in the previous video and so on usually the git status made some some kind of sense but now once we've changed the file simply i can't understand what's going on here okay the file is listed as both stage state okay so <clears throat> there is uh, a stage state changes to be committed right in the staging area and also in the unstaged unstaged right unstaged state when it has been simply modified okay so changes not staged for commit and one question that you should be asking yourselves and also that you should be asking me is <clears throat> how can a file be in two different states at one and the same time so that's very interesting very interesting and very important to to understand because that's the same file it it is in two different states kind of simultaneously so let's try to figure out uh, what's going on here and talk about it in depth and prepare you for more complicated situations just like this one and also for more complicated commands and so on and so forth so <clears throat> we have staged the file previously and added it to the staging area and our good night file contained some ready content as part of it right it was that was the previous content in the staging area right that's the previous content in the staging area that's the content that's the staging area and <clears throat> it, it it already had some ready content um now this content okay it was kind of documented and prepared for the snapshot okay so basically it means that previously when we used the git add command previously when the file was just like this and we used the git add command to add the file to the staging area then in this case git has taken the file as is as it was in that particular moment with this given content and staged it okay is that clear so this file in that is currently at the staging area okay this particular file should not get affected by the optional new modifications and additions and revisions and whatsoever you may do in your working directory so totally different things okay you see the difference right there are basically two revisions of the file at two different places one place is at the staging area with this fixed or documented uh, content 
and the other one is the in the unstaged area okay in it was modified in the in the uh, working directory this line has been added so kind of two different revisions of the file uh, having different states one at the staging area that cannot be affected and the second one which we've modified is in um, the working directory and it can also git can see that this particular file has been changed Whew, so awesome i hope that things are getting a little bit um more clear to you but i think that this concept is not the easiest one to grasp at first but i think that throughout um <clears throat> the course and throughout solving examples and seeing different additional um videos even if it's not clear a hundred percent now things will be more clear as we uh, keep on moving forward so no worries guys and now <clears throat> let's take uh, a look also once again at um at our workflow diagram which really helps us a lot i think and <clears throat> Uh, the file that is already in the staging area, here it is, the goodnight.py, the Python file that simply prints goodnight and sweet dreams, it remains the same, ready to be committed. Okay, so that was kind of snapshot and that's it. And it simply means that if you would have committed now, okay, if you've made the commit command, then the exact file you've added to the staging area okay not including the further changes not including the changes we've just made then this staged file will um, would have been documented as part of the snapshot so it will go like to the fifth uh, state okay so I think that's to the fifth state actually to the repository to be to be part of the database so I hope that makes sense to you and the version of the modified file in the working directory would not have been documented since its changes were not even staged for commit. So once again, its changes, this file changes, this new line, were not even staged for commit. So that's basically what happens here behind the scenes okay we kind of have two two states of the file at one at the same time and that kind of makes sense right guys because i mean we said that we should add a file to the staging area once we know that we've made all the changes we wanted to do as part of the next commit and there is probably no reason to modify the file prior its associated commit and that's super important to understand. So <clears throat> if we will take a look at the five states diagram we've used so far, uh, the five states diagram we've used so far, then it's going to look like the good night will actually have two additions in two different states. All right, guys. And if you should, uh, <clears throat> and if you would like to add the additional changes uh, you've just made before making the snapshot, because you know that these particular changes i don't know like it's very mandatory that they should be a part of the next snapshot okay so if these changes it's super mandatory and it's very important that these changes will be part of the next snapshot and not only this part to be uh, uh this code to be part of the next snapshot then in this case what you should do is <clears throat> simply use the git add command okay the git add of the file itself and it will also modify the file in the staging area adding also uh this additional um this additional revision addition that you've just made and now if you will commit it you will commit the whole new document the whole new data in the commit um, command so 
once again, two options before and after making the commit, before and after making the additions. I hope that's clear. Previously, we said that if at this state, at this stage, uh, when we have one file here at the staging area with one uh, text, with one content, and also another file that is not staged, then in this case, if we have used the git commit, it will simply go like taking this file and put it in uh, the repository database. But if we want to document the changes also done here in the next commit, then simply use again git add and it will take these changes, add them to here and the new file that will be created will be something like that. And in this case, now if you do commit, you will put in the database repository of this file all of this information. So this is it. And I hope that's clear to you guys. I think that uh, in this video, we've covered some pretty decent information, understanding that a file can be more than just in one state. And what happens if you modify a file when it's still in the staging area, hasn't been committed yet, and what will happen behind the scenes. And this information, I'm sure about it, it will help you a lot when you will come to, to different situations. So yeah, guys, um, very good job. Keep on practicing, keep on writing notes. I'm not sure I can create, a, I don't know, like a documented file, a summarized file for this kind of explanation, because I think that uh, it will be really hard to put it in words. I think that this visualization demonstrates everything precisely. And I think that maybe you should write your own notes down and to like to create some summarized version for yourself to explain what happens when, where, how and why. And yeah, this is it for this video. My name is Vlad. This is Alpha Tech, and we are getting technology better. So until next time, I'll see you then. Alrighty, so <clears throat> in this video, we are going to talk about commits and snapshot. Now, at this point, once we already know most of the states that our files may be in, we will talk about how we can make the commit, how can we commit the changes documented in the staging area. And <clears throat> to do so, we will talk about how we can create this nice little snapshot, okay, of all the information, of all the documents in the staging area for our project. So if we were planning to work with um, the commit command, okay, if we were planning to like to understand, okay, how it works in more depth, then one important thing that you have to remember is that only the files that were staged, okay, in the staging area in the index, only these files may be actually part of the standard commit. This means that files that are unstaged, okay, files that you basically haven't run the git add command upon them. So these files are not going to be part of the commit. And I mean, that makes sense. They are not tracked by, uh, they are tracked by git, okay, they may also be tracked by git, but they are not staged, they are not in the index area. So basically, we will just refer to the situation to the standard flow where we are going to commit things right from the staging area and just from there. All right. So awesome. And let's get to work. And what I want us to do right now is to simply take a look at how we can commit the changes. Basically, we can say that there is a very simple command that can do this operation for us and simply use this command to create a snapshot of our project. 
And this command goes like this. So git commit dash m and some message. Okay, so the dash m flag, okay, here it is. Let me show you. Okay, here it is. The dash m flag is used to specify the message associated with the commit. And once you hit the enter button and run the commit command, then you are going to see some output, some information regarding the commit itself. So once again, the command to make the commit from the staging area and put it inside um, the git repository database goes like this, git commit dash m and a descriptive message specifying why this commit was made. And once you hit and you complete the commit itself, you are going to see some information <clears throat> and this information is going, this information is regarding the commit itself. This information is going to include some interesting information. Um, the first one is the branch that the commit was made to, okay? And in this case, it's the master branch, okay? You can see it right here, the branch name, master. And we are going to talk about it much further in the following chapters. So I think that by now, uh, yeah, we are going also to discuss it. Uh, no worries about that, guys. And <clears throat> additional thing that I want to that I want you to see and to notice in uh, the commit information is the SHA SHA one um, checksum that the commit has. Basically, it's just this nice number here, which is something that I hope we will have time to cover up also in this course, but I'm not sure about that because there are <clears throat> a couple of usages uh, that can be done using this number and also um, it may take time to dive uh, more in depth, but ba basically wh what I recommend you is simply to, 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 um, uh, to refer to this number as some unique number just for now that is associated and specified for a given commit. So different commits will have different SHA-1 numbers. And if we will have time in this course, we will dive into uh, this understanding and this explanation even further. But for now, basically we have the branch, we have this unique number, unique checksum uh, that the commit has. And we can also see the number of files that were changed in current commit. Um, basically, you can see here two files changed, three insertions, okay? This is some additional information regarding the files, these two files that were added and removed and so on. So awesome. So the two files, files changed, two files. You know, <clears throat> let's go back to the workflow diagram and summarize everything we've talked so far. So what the commit does is basically it records a snapshot of the files in the staging area, right? That's the staging area. And any file that you haven't staged, okay, different files that were here, here and there, will still be sitting there modified and not part of the commit, okay? That's what I want to like to emphasize here, they will not be part of the commits. And although it won't be part of the current commit, it will definitely be possible to do another commit and to add these changes uh, right when we need them. Okay, so <clears throat> once the commit operation is successful, okay, that's also something very important to understand here. So. Uh, Let's just briefly summarize because I think we've lost a little bit of track here. Basically, we can have different files at different states, okay? And in the commit, only the states, uh, the files that are in the staging area will be documented. So if there will be another file, let's say, I don't know, goodbye file uh, .py, which is not in the staging area, it will not be part of the commit. But if you would like to make it part of the commit, you can add it to the staging area and then commit it, okay? So that's uh, something we have covered. 
And another thing that I think we should cover is a situation uh, um, of what happens once the commit operation has been successfully executed. So in this case, Git may look at the files, okay? So basically you have here these two files in <coughs> the, um, the staging area and you've done, you've completed the commit. And right afterwards, each of these files, okay, it may be either either at um, the tracked by Git state or either at tracked by Git but not changed. So basically it depends on what we've been doing with these files after it has been staged, right? Similar situation to what we've seen in one of our previous videos or in the previous video. So we've staged a certain file in some given time and since then until we've made the commit itself the file may have been modified in the working directory just like we've done it with goodnight.py and it's not the same as at the staging area so once you will make the commit to the stage revision of the file then afterwards okay basically it's still there right it still will be uh, a version in the working directory which is not changed and changed but after the commit, it is kind of uh, uh, what you want to proceed with, okay? So once again, uh, the whole point of this is to understand what happens after the commit, what happens before the commit, what happens in the staging area, and <clears throat> basically uh, the main understanding of the fact that a file can be at a few different states uh, kind of simultaneously, but that's not actually it's uh, basically moving to the staging area, some document, and also it can be in the tracked by Git and also in the changed and not changed. So yeah, I hope that's clear to you guys and you understand what happens next, okay? After these files were committed and it's part of the database, you have these files like goodnight.py, helloworld.py, and whether they were changed uh, a little bit like goodnight.py, while we were still in the staging area so that's the state of the file that you will see the only state after the commit and also regarding the hello world and if it's still not 100 percent clear to you guys try to formulate some question and feel free to ask me some questions in the q a section and also make sure that uh you check maybe somebody else has already asked a similar question and got a full solution to it so it may also save you plenty of time so thank you for so, so thank you so much for watching and i will see you in the next videos bye bye skipping the staging area what is going on guys my name is vlad this is alpha tech and this is our amazing programming course where we are talking about version control systems in general and also in particular we are talking about git and in this video we are going to talk about skipping staging area and we will see how we can skip the staging area just like the title implies and basically what commands does it how we can simply do it in one line what flag should be used and so on and so forth so i hope you are ready and let's go so when it may be useful basically there may be times when you would like to skip working with the staging area with the index area right so uh, this is the staging area, the index area, and you would like simply to, to avoid the need to use the git add command to move the files from, for example, the third state or the second state to the fourth state, and only then after it has been staged using the git add command, only then to use uh, the git commit and to move it from here to here and add it to uh, the commit history, the commit database of your repository. So that's not something that we talked about so far, right? Because we had our um, 
our organized and our structure of working. First of all, edit the files, then add the files to the staging area. And finally, use the git commit to like to create this snapshot, this uh, given snapshot of all the documents and uh, of all the data and to document it into the database repository. But now I'm going to show you, I, I don't know if you are uh, going to use that a lot. It really depends on uh, your uh, pace of working because sometimes you like you need to work really fast. I'm not saying that's the right approach, but I'm saying that some people are using this approach and I also simply want you to know what does it mean uh, and how it can be used so then you can decide for yourself because you're big guys, big girls, right? I mean, you can decide for yourself if, that, if that's something appropriate for you, if that's something that you can handle or not. So how does it look like? Basically, it's a simple command. It's just like using the standard commit command. Uh, just that now we are going to add the dash a flag to the git commit command, okay? So it's going to look like this, git commit dash a, okay? And dash m in the message pretty much like we've done it previously, okay? So this command will take, okay, what's the, what, what, What's the difference here is just this flag, this dash A, and all this command is going to do is simply to take all the tracked files, okay, all the files that were here and here, okay, all the tracked files by Git, and what it will do with these files is simply to move them into the staging area, and right after that, these files will be committed with the associated commit message. So that's going to be like two operations, two steps in just one command, okay? So that's basically what's going to happen. There is nothing complicated regarding this flag, okay? And I think it may be easily added. And basically, let's use it like this, git commit dash a and dash m, a commit with a skipped staging area. So. Basically, what was done behind the scenes is that it was moved from this okay, area and this area if we had multiple files through the staging area and right to the committed repository to the committed database. So that's uh, the important part about the dash A flag. You can decide for yourself if you like it or not. And just a quick reminder that right after the commit is complete, we know that the files that were committed will move to either their unmodified or modified states, just like we've previously discussed. In this case, probably they're going to go to the second state because we took and simply uh, committed everything from these uh, states. Awesome. So one last note before we finish talking about this command, is that I want you to be really careful when you are going to use this flag. Although it may look really convenient at first, because why do I have to use two commands, git add and then git commit and so on, it may also lead to some unexpected things that you may accidentally do when including unwanted changes in some of the files, okay? So be very careful and like make sure you understand everything. And lastly, yeah, yeah that's that's the last uh, last note. Uh, I said, I think by probably by mistake that uh, all of the files are going to be committed from the second and the third uh, states. And I just came to my mind that I'm probably uh, just said uh, a little mistake because files that are not changed, okay? And you should pay close attention even if I'm making some mistake, things should come to your mind. So think about this situation. If a file that is being tracked by Git and it's not changed, will the git add command and also the git commit dash a command 
take files from the tracked by git but not changed and put them either in the staging area or in the committed area. So think about it because here uh, lies your deep understanding of whether you know the answer to this question or uh, not. Okay, so think about it. If files were here in the track by git and changed uh, using the git add and the git commit dash a file, will they move to here and to here respectively, right? And also if the file was the fi one file, a file a, or files were in the track by git but not changed, will they move also to the staging area or to the committed area? So until next time, guys, think about it. Probably no, but I'm leaving it to you. So uh, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another very, very important video about branches. And in this video, we are going to talk also about some real life scenarios as well as we are going to uh, prepare our development process for the topic of merging and then also merge uh, to how to resolve different merge conflicts. So yeah, I think there is a lot of things, a lot of important things for us to cover up in this video and also in the following two or three videos. So guys, uh, I recommend you to stay tuned, prepare yourself and let's go. So first of all, let's say that you've been working already on some Git project, let's say for some time you've been working and now I'm going to also use here some visualization and uh, demonstration to show you basically how the commit history so far, okay, how it looks like. So basically you have your project, you've been working on it and let's say you have, I don't know, like commit number one, commit number two, uh, let me just correct it, make it more beautiful, commit number two, and that's where your master branch is located. So you can see here, this is the master branch, we had a few commits, let's say two commits just for simplicity, so C1 is commit number one, C2 is commit number two. Good, so now what we have to talk about is some real life scenario that you may come across. And this scenario goes as following. So assume that your boss comes and asks you to work on this newly amazing feature that he has in mind, uh, that basically this feature can take your whole product to a whole new level. So you're thinking to yourself, well, why not? I should get started right away. And you know that it's not a good practice to start working on different experimental features and making this new whole development process on the master branch, right? That's not recommended since the master branch is basically used for the production, right? Is it for, oh, come a second. Okay, why is it so big? So yeah, so the master branch is used for the production. And we don't want to make any changes here unless they are kind of approved and then they can be used in the master. So basically the development process uh, is required for you to just create an additional branch that will be used mainly for this task of developing and working on, th on this newly suggested feature, right? So for example, what you may consider doing is creating this new feature. So let's just dive into coding and see what will happen here. So let's write down this command. So git checkout dash b and here we will specify the name of the branch of this new branch as feature. So git checkout dash b feature. And this command, let's basically run it, okay? And this command, is actually a mix of the following two commands. So the first command you may be familiar with is git branch feature. Okay, so this command basically just creates a new feature. Okay, some new branch called feature with 
um, basically uh, this is the first command and then once the branch has been created then we are going to check out this new branch okay using this git checkout feature okay so two commands uh, basically to create a branch and then to check out to this new branch both of these commands may be uh, satisfied just by running this command use, using the git checkout dash b and the name of the feature to create a new branch and also to check out to this branch awesome so now let's just go and draw what we've created so we've created basically a new branch currently it's here that's the new branch it's called feature 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 it's called feature and now what we would like to do is basically to make some changes make some commits and simply keep working and developing this feature branch so let's say we will list all the files and we will see okay so there is the hello world.py file so vi hello world.py and the new feature basically let's make it like i don't know let's call this file as a feature uh, .py file and this file basically has like i don't know uh, this is the start of the new feature asked by the boss okay so that's basically a new file you created and um, your feature development process is not yet ready but that's just part of the development so one thing that you can do is just use the git add feature okay and just to document these changes so git commit dash m and uh, initial part let's call it initial part of the development is now a development is now ready okay just some descriptive message and if we want to take a look at how this uh, commit will look like behind the scenes all right so we have the master we have the feature and we've been working now on the feature branch and we've made additional commit so this commit will look like this okay this is the third commit c3 and the feature branch is no longer pointing to this c2 commit but rather this feature points to here so feature and master branch the production is currently just one commit uh, behind the new commit in the feature branch so that's basically how it looks like how the diagram looks like behind the scenes and you are still not finished with all the changes and all the developments that should be made to the feature to the feature uh, <clears throat> .py file but just right before you're about to finish your angry client calls you okay and that's a second scenario and usually they come together and this client happens to call you and asks urgently to fix some issue that he's found out um, and the product basically can't go any further unless it's being taken care of by you right away and yeah that's not good news he's got right because in fact it seems that there is a totally new bug that has to be taken care of as soon as possible and the question that comes right now is what should you do what do you think what should you do should you fix the bug while you are still working on this new feature on the feature branch or maybe should you do something else my recommendation is to separate these tasks especially if they are totally unrelated just like the situation we've got right here so if we come down and come to think about this whole scenario for a couple of moments then we will be able to see that we basically have two main tasks the first one is the development of this new feature which we are doing right here on this feature branch and the second task is fixing the bug that is even part of the master branch right because the bug has been identified here at c2 branch okay at c2 commit on the master branch because that's 
uh, the bug that was reported from the production. So that's why I suggest you not to make the fix of this bug and deploy it along with this new feature. So not to proceed working on the bug right here in the feature branch. It probably doesn't have anything to do with one, one another. And also, if you will do so, if you will fix the bug also here, all right, if you will fix also the bug here on this branch, then what may happen next is that, for example, let's say you would like to go back and to find where this bug was fixed or maybe where uh, this feature was added and like you want to remove this feature. So you will not be able to separate between these two and that may be kind of a problem and it will be just a waste of time and that's something that you definitely want to avoid as soon as possible not even start developing and not even start fixing this bug on this feature branch so i hope that's clear to you guys it's also very important in terms of reverting or doing some other operations so let me know if you still have any questions and if you need uh, if you still need any clarification. And with that being said, let's proceed moving forward. So what you should do in such a case, right after we talked about what you shouldn't do and what I don't recommend you doing. So what you should do in such a case is first of all, check out to the master branch. And what we are going to do is to create additional branch to fix the bug that will basically look like this. We'll create it on the master branch. We'll create a new branch, right? And then we'll make all the changes, commit them, and basically all of it will look like another branch like this, okay? So that's how we want it to look like, okay? Let's call this branch an issue. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to do to make some C4 commit. And this commit will be related to the bug fix, to the issue fix after uh, getting, getting it fixed from the master branch instead of fixing it up from the feature. So what we have to do now is basically to go to the master branch. So git checkout, checkout master, right? And however, before you do that, before you hit the enter button to run the git checkout master command, note that if your working directory or let's say your staging area has uncommitted changes uh, that basically may conflict with the branch you're checking out to, then git won't simply git will not let you to switch the branches and you may get some conflict, some error and so on. So it's, base, uh, it's best to have a clean working state when you switch branches. So basically, let's say if you are going to uh, check out to master, so make sure that if you run git status, you don't have anything uh, problematic that may stop your, um, your checkout process. Okay, so git checkout master, and basically now it works. And the reason uh, why it works is because uh, is because this greetings.py file was modified previously on the master branch and I just wanted to leave it to you to show you that although uh, the checkout process works here but it still it still sees this file as a modified file um, but basically there are no conflicts between them. So that's why the checkout here works. All right. So now, since we have an urgent issue to fix, what we will do is simply to follow some similar steps to what we've applied previously. So git checkout dash B issue. Okay. And this would create a new branch issue and check out to it right after that. Uh, we will be able to make some changes and commit them and so on. So let's first of all create, so switch to a new branch issue. Let's clear this out. And now basically the diagram still doesn't look the way uh, that it's drawn, okay? So the git, the git, 
The Git repository still doesn't look this way because the issue itself, the issue branch itself is basically look looks like this right now. So issue, okay? And there is no C4 commit. That's what we want to do. So let's basically delete it and let's do it. Okay, so uh, right now we will run the following change. So let's say we just wanted to modify in the issue. Let's just read this hello world file. Print hello world, print goodbye. And I don't know, we just wanted to modify the hello world file to make it like, I don't know, adding a new line. Let's say print. Um, this is, let's do it like this. Let's print here. This is, Vlad from Alpha Tech. Alpha Tech. So that's the bug. There uh, was missing this really cute and ni nice message. So that's what was really urgent for the client. And basically, uh, we can say that we are done with this change. And we can also add this file and then also to commit it. So commit and descriptive message to instructor, instructor Vlad has been added, all right? So now, basically, after this commit, all our, all of our structure, okay, all of our structure really does look like this. So that's the diagram, diagram of what's happening behind the scenes. So there were a few commits made in the history of the development and then we got to the master branch the production and in this branch we decided to start working on a new feature and we started working on it on a new branch we made some commits but still uh, this commit is not uh, the final commit we should also add some changes here but then the boss or the client calls you and tells you that he got an urgent issue to fix and this issue has to be taken care of from the master branch. So there you go, you create a new issue branch, you made make the changes, and then you commit the changes. And that's basically how the diagram looks like. Awesome. So guys, I have a question for you. Okay, so here we have like three branches, right? We have three branches. The first one is called the master, the second one is the feature and the third one is the issue. And each of them has some additional commits which were made and so on. And one thing before we move ahead, uh, that's the question that's usually asked at this step is, why did we have to go back from the feature branch back to the master branch, right? Like to check out to the master branch and only then to create a new branch for issue. Why couldn't we simply when we were at the feature branch, why couldn't we like to create a new branch? How, how do you think the diagram would basically be changed if we would have created this issue branch when we are, were still on the feature branch? So give yourself some time and think about it. Think about that, uh, about the diagram you've just seen and also think about if and how it will be changed as well as how it could affect the whole development process. So simply take a, a, paper, uh, a pen and a paper and write down, try to draw uh, this whole process and think about how it will get changed. All right, so maybe I will make also additional video explaining this even further, but I think that for now that will be it. All right, so... Um, now let's keep moving forward and finalize what we want to talk about in this video as well as in the next. So what we would like to know is once we are done making all the corrections and all the features and basically making all the necessary tests to make, the to make sure that the issue has been taken care of and also that the feature will be developed and so on, we would like to know uh, and to start thinking about how these changes that were made on a totally different branches, 
how they can be merged back into the master branch. So this operation basically is called merging. We will try to merge, first of all, the issue branch, okay, this branch with this updated information into the master branch and make it kind of ready for production, okay, we'll update the master branch, okay, because we remember that the master branch is usually used for production, right? And then once we will merge both of them, fixing up the issue and the master uh, branch, what we will do is keep on our develop, development of the feature branch, maybe adding some additional commit to finalize the feature. And we will then also merge the, the changes and the additions that we've made on this feature branch back into the master. And then we will have a totally updated product that has uh, a fixed issue as well as a new feature. So basically guys, there is a lot of things for us to cover up in the next videos. And that's something we are going to make very, very like thorough explanation and see a full demonstration about how it can be done. So I think there are a lot of good things on their way and you should definitely stay tuned and get yourself ready for the next video. So until then, until we proceed with the merging operation after demonstrating you how the branches steps can be used again, I wish you a great day. My name is Vlad, this is AlphaTech and I will see you in the next all right, so in the previous video, we started our discussion about how different branches can be used for solving different issues, for solving or for basically making new features, developing new features, solving issues, and so on. And here is the diagram that we've started working with in the previous video. Uh, so basically, the first step was like to see the history of the commits that were done in the master branch, let's say, without having any branches so far. So that's the history, commit one, da la la, up to commit number two. Let's say just for simplicity, two commits in the history of the commits. And then we decided like to start working on a new feature. That's what the boss asked us, uh, as asked us to do. So we created a new feature branch and then we made some changes and made a third commit. This is C3. Uh, and this feature was ahead of the master branch in one commit. And basically then uh, the client came and told us that we still haven't, basically the feature was not ready yet. It was ready like just partially. And then the client comes and says, okay, I got this new issue, this new bug that you have to fix. And the client was like looking at this production uh, production version in the master branch. So that's why we checked out to the master branch, created a new issue branch, and then also fixed this issue, this bug, and made the fourth commit in this case. And now in this video, uh, what we are going to do is basically to talk about how we can merge everything into the master branch. And we will see also a couple of ways to do so. We will talk about the general explanation of the merge operation. And yeah, I think this video is going to be very interesting. But before we do that, let us talk a little bit about the process of merging, okay, the general process. So by the definition of the merge operation, so there is the merge operation, what's going to happen is that you are simply going to combine multiple sequences of commits into being a part of just one unified history, okay, so this should make a unified history. History. And now let's see exactly how it will look like in a couple of scenarios. So on the first step, uh, what we would like to do is simply to merge the following two branches, the master branch, 
all right, where it all began, kind, kind of ancestor for both of them. And also uh, to merge this master with the issue uh, branch that we fixed the bug. Okay, so in this commit, we have fixed the bug. Awesome. And the way most of the merge commands you will see in this video uh, are used to merge another branch, which is, for, for example, issue. Issue is the branch. Into the current branch we are going to be at when the command will be executed. So we will have a current branch, like in this case, the current branch is issue, but we will make the master branch as the current branch and the issue branch will be the other branch and it will be kind of merged with the master. So to do that, to merge the issue branch into the master branch, we are going, going first of all, to go back to the master branch. And this can be done easily by running the git checkout master command. So now we are at the master branch and what we are going to do is simply run the merge command. So git merge issue. And now hit enter. And there you go. Basically, uh, the master branch now will be updated by the merge. And also it will simply look like this. So let's just remove this whole unnecessary information. Okay, so that's the fixed bug. That's the issue, that's the master production, let's just clean it up a little bit. So what will happen now behind the scenes is something like that. The master will no longer be here, okay, because the master branch is going to move here, they were merged, okay. And the way, the way, the kind of merge that was made is the fast forward type, okay. So that's the first type that we are going to talk about is the fast forward. And that makes sense because the commit here, C4, uh, C4, which is pointed by our issue one branch, is a head ahead of the commit pointer uh, pointed by the master, okay, which is C2 in this example. So this type of marriage, the fast forward, fast forward type, is basically uh, basically happens whenever there is some sort of linear path from the current branch, which is master, right? That's the current branch that we want to merge to the target branch, which in this case is issue. You, you can see that there is one ancestor and you simply move ahead, moving kind of linear way from this branch to this branch using this C2 to C4 commit. So they can be easily merged using the fast forward approach just by moving the master from here to there. So there will be no master here. And basically, you got, uh, you got this diagram right now. And the reason why this type of merge operation is legit is because all the histories, all the histories of both of these branches were combined successfully and all of their commits, okay, are reachable from the current pointed commit. So C4, you know, you can access to C2, to C1 and so on. So basically for both of them, it's legit and you can access all the previous commits, all the histories. So basically this is the type of the fast forward approach to merge something, uh, two branches that are kind of lying on the same line. Is that clear to you guys? And just just note that this kind of operation is not generally describing how the merge process works, but Git simplifies its internal operation by using this fast forward to move the pointer ahead. So that's how the merge is accomplished right here. So once again, if a commit can be reached by following some straight lines of commits, like in this case, or maybe if the issue was even here in C5, so that was the issue, it will still be able to use the fast forward approach because that's basically kind of linear way. Awesome. So let's just clear this out and tell you what, 
what what's happening right here so basically okay if you come to think about it what what the master branch now has is the previous version of all the files it had in c2 commit as well as the changes to some of the files that were done uh, in the issue branch so it was like uh, some changes that were done in the hello world.py file now the master branch also have them has them <laughs> so now once this first step is clear to you guys uh, and after applying the merge operation the structure looks like this and this means that our urgent issue has been taken care of and we can go back to developing the feature and finish its changes right where we left off right where we left off from uh, for the branch feature but before that if you will take a close look at the diagram okay you will see that the usage of the issue of the issue branch is probably no longer uh, going to be required it's no longer useful right so that's why we may consider deleting it because we have the master branch pointing to the same uh, commit so there is no reason to keep this issue branch and if we want to delete or to remove a given branch this can simply be done by using the Greek git branch dash d for delete and here what you will have to do is just to specify the branch name so basically in our case it's going to be git branch dash d issue okay so we are going to delete the issue branch and basically that will show you that this given branch has been deleted good so now this will simply look like this okay there will be no issue and there will be like just the master branch okay so i hope that's clear and basically in the next video we are going to proceed even further and to see how we can finish up uh, doing all the feature changes and then merging it back to and with the master branch so yeah this was the first merge command that you've uh completed successfully and i want to say congratulations because you keep moving forward these topics and this kind of understanding is not the basic one you already have some good and solid understanding of what's going on behind the scenes how different uh scenarios can and should be handled how can you create new branches how to move from branch to branch how to merge using the fast forward approach to merge two branches that lie on the same let's say linear uh history of commits and now all that remains for us uh, to complete this discussion is to move forward for the next video and to learn also something new so until then guys let me know what you think of this video and what you think of the course so far your reviews and feedback uh is really really appreciable appreciate and uh yeah i think this is it i'm going to take a break of two three minutes and then we will move on to the next video all righty welcome back and <clears throat> now we are going to proceed with the merge and one question that i've got to you guys uh, right now is do you think that the changes made previously in our issue branch are actually part of our feature branch sorry do you think that the changes made in the feature branch are now part of the master branch i mean there were some changes made to feature right the feature branch then does it make sense that after the previous marriage operation that we've done here where it is here get the git marriage issue does it make sense that um <clears throat> this merge operation between the master and the issue branches um, will the master branch now also include the information from the feature branch think about that for a few moments and once you are done let me tell you this answer 
And the answer to this question is absolutely no. The changes we did previously on, on this feature branch to make some and to add some additional features are simply not part of our master branch, okay, since they were not merged, not yet at least. And the fact, the fact that we've merged the issue branch and the master branch doesn't have anything to do with the feature branch in this case, okay? So I hope that's clear because this is a question I've been asked and I want to clear it out for you as much as possible. So what we are going to do at the moment is just to merge these two branches, the feature branch and the master branch. But before we do so, uh, what I want us to do is just to update, okay, to update the feature branch and to like to finish uh, the development of the feature. And basically this development requires a little bit of additional um, improvement. So that's why we are going also to edit one file just to make it, I don't know, even more beautiful and closer to real life scenarios. So that's why I want you to go and to edit, I don't know, another file. Let's call this file new Mars message. Just edit it. Hello Mars. Let's just add some additional message here. Like, uh, I don't know, la la la. Okay. Just something additional to help us to complete the development of the process of, of, of the feature. And what do you, th do you think right now? If we do git commit, will there be additional commit made here from C3, let's say to C5? Or maybe we have done something wrong and we modified the master branch and that's not what we wanted because we wanted to continue the update of the feature on the feature branch. Take a second and think about it. And probably guys, you are right. We added it, the master branch and that's not something that we wanted. So let's do git status. And we can see here that we have like this new Mars message and we don't want to change it on the master branch. So that's a good time to show you how to discard changes in working directory, okay, and to make it as it was previously, okay, we, we talked about it in one of the videos. So now we are simply going to do that again. So git restore, and you can see that all of this command can be seen right here on uh, the git status output, very easy. And here specify the file name. So that's going to be like new Mars message.py. Let's clear this out. And let's just use um, cat to see the file. What was it Mars? What was it? What was the name of the file? So cat new Mars message, right? So new Mars message. And you can see that um, we modified it correctly to what it was previously. And now we know that this feature, this message should be added on the feature branch. So that's why we are going to check out to the feature branch. And now we are going to do this new Mars message update. So let's just go here and say that la 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 should be added here. Okay, that's part of the feature to print la 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 to the screen. Awesome. And now we know that we are at the feature branch and we will make add to the new Mars and git commit dash m new Mars message. Oops, git commit um, feature, let's say feature is complete. Okay, so the feature is complete. Awesome. So how this will look like in our diagram. So let's just draw it here. So that's the feature. Okay, it was pointing to the C3 commit. And now the new commit that we've just made is simply let's call it I don't know C5. So that's the fifth commit. When we um, have completed the development of the feature and here we have also of the branch called feature fee what's going on today feature awesome so that's the fifth commit under the feature branch you can see here the feature branch right so that's good that's good guys and now 
what we have to do is simply once we know that the feature has been developed and is ready to go okay the feature here is ready to go let's just draw it so i'm ready i'm ready the feature is ready to go we need to merge both of these commits on both of these branches into just one branch which should be the master branch since that's the branch of the production so what do you think will the merge operation here be pretty much the same as it was previously like using the fast forward approach or maybe we will use here another approach what do you think well <clears throat> You see, guys, we said that the fast forward approach can take place only if the commits kind of lie on the same line. Some commit that uh, was a direct ancestor for, for both of them. Um, and we basically, not a direct ancestor, but simply if both commits uh, lie on the same line. And we can see here that it's not actually the case right because c4 and c5 here they are not directly connected it should go like this okay so that's not directly directly connected and that's not pretty much the case they are kind of unrelated in some straight order so that's why the merging operation is going to be quite different so make sure you pay extra attention right now because that's very important. So let's go back to our uh, master branch. So git checkout master. And now we are going to make the merge operation. So git merge and here specify the branch of feature. Press enter and there you go. And this message you're probably getting here is a little bit different from the message you received previously. And I mean, that makes sense since our development history has been splitted, right? Has been splitted from some common previous um, ancestor and the branches commits are not on a linear line, okay? They've been diverged and splitted. And when that's the case, then Git has to make some calculations and not just to move the branch pointer like to here, okay? Because the changes here do not apply here and so on. And this type of merge is also called, let's da -da -dum, write it down. It's called the three way merge. Okay. So this type of merge is called the three way merge. And in this way, what the Git system will create is a new snapshot, a new dedicated commit that will tie the histories of both branches by taking all the necessary information out of there and merging it into just one final commit. So let's take a look at how it will look like. So basically, let's remove the master from here. Let's remove all of this information. And basically, what will be created now is just the following. It will be it will look like this. So taking from this parent and from this parent and basically creating this C six new commit will have uh, which will have both of the branches and by both of the branches of course i mean it will have the master branch okay here will be the master branch the updated master branch since we merged the target the target branch which was feature into the master so that will be the master branch and we say uh we said previously that the target branch usually is not affected so the feature branch is still going to be like here feature it's going to be right here but uh we do not care at all uh, for the feature branch right now because we know that c6 this commit already has all the information from the previous branch uh, after fixing the issue and also with the the new feature develop uh, developed at C5. So the master branch basically contains now all this history integrated in just one merge commit. So what we have also here is two parents. Okay, C4 and C5 are the kind of parents of C6. And if you will take a look um, 
at the message at the kind of message it will say like marriage made by the recursive strategy okay and it basically has created a new marriage to commit that's what it means and <clears throat> also there is an option to see this information so let's just run git log dash one we'll run this command and take a look at the last commit and you will see that this commit is a new commit that was created during this three-way merging process so you can see here uh, that merge branch feature that's the associated kind of message and th the last commit is this one c6 and it has integrated everything from this c5 and c4 from these two branches into just one branch so now we are done with this marriage and everything seems to be completed successfully with no issues and new features uh, on the master branch basically your product should be ready to go and should be ready for for production and let's just not forget to delete the previous branch because probably now there will be no need uh, to do something with the feature branch so yeah i think that we can delete it let's just run git branch dash d and here specify the feature branch and the feature branch has been removed and voila all the changes from the two different branches during this whole process of development and bug fixing has now been merged successfully finally very good job guys not straightforward uh, explanation it was not e an easy one for me i think it was one of the tough toughest videos for me to like to explain and to record uh so i hope i've managed to pass this information uh in a good way to you and yeah if you still have any questions uh feel free to ask them my recommendation is also give it a shot on your own try to practice it write down some code some files play a little bit with going from one branch to another branch and so on and so forth and also try to merge different branches try to understand when one approach will be used over the other what is um, the difference between them what approach does not involve uh, the creation of a new commit and what approach does involve that and think about it uh, come to more insights maybe watch this video even once more because i think it, it it usually takes time to like to grasp this whole idea of merging and of uh using the branches correctly um yeah so let me know your thoughts on this video also in uh the next videos hopefully we'll make um we will also make some discussion regarding how we can get because that's also something that happens quite quite a lot uh what is the marriage conflict okay because not all the merges that you are going to do during your development process either that's going to be by yourself or whether that's going to be with your team not all the merges are going to go like that smooth um and there may be conflicts there may be problems and not always git will be able like to to do everything on its own and that's when we are going to receive to get from git a conflict and we will have to resolve these conflicts but more on that later on until then enjoy your time make some break drink some water tea i don't know what you whatever you you like to drink and Thank you guys for watching and we will see each other again soon enough all right so now it's time to talk about conflicts and to see a full demonstration of the situation when it happens let's see how it happens in real time so that this way you will not be surprised when you will start working on your own projects and actually guys 
that's why I think that my course, okay, that this course is so useful. And that's simply because there are plenty of practical examples and straight to the point explanations without only showing you just these PowerPoint slides. This is also kind of nice, but I think that it's just much less practical. All right, so with that being said, let's get to work. And the first thing that I want uh, to do is, let's say that we have some file on our master branch, okay, with the following content. Let's create this file. So vi example.py and create this new file and simply put three lines of code into it. So print hello world and let's make additional line. Let's make it how are you? And the third line will be like print goodbye. Okay, so very simple file with just three printing commands. And that's it. So let's save it using the W and Q. And now let's make sure that this file is also part of our repository database by simply adding it to the staging area and then we will commit it. So just type down git add example.py and then let's check the status. Okay, awesome. So changes to be committed is just the example.py. So git commit, git commit dash m. So I don't know, added an example example file to demonstrate to demonstrate to demonstrate a conflict resolution okay so that this file will be used for this demonstration and so basically we've done the commit and then let's say the first teammate decides to work also on this file for some reason okay let's say he, let's say he's not going to work on the master branch but rather uh, since he's working on some issue some bug or something like that he's going to work on the issue branch okay so let's create an additional branch let's go like git checkout dash b issue number one and basically we are going to get to this branch so switch to a new branch. Let's just check the status to make sure everything is pretty much okay. Awesome. And now let's change this file. So vi example.py. Okay. And we know that this file, that's pretty much the content in the master branch. And now we are just going to modify it a little bit. And what I want you to do is simply to modify this file. Uh, let's just, instead of this second line, let's use here. I don't know, uh, let's say it's a good day today. And that's it. So simply modifying the second line on the issue one branch in this example.py file. Okay, is that clear so far? Nothing complicated. And <clears throat> meanwhile, meanwhile, for some reason, uh, you as let's say is the lead developer, uh, on you want to make some changes and also to modify for whatever reason that may be uh, this file on the master branch. So you also have to change a little bit of its content and for that you simply would like to check out to the master branch. But before you do so, let's just add these changes. So git add example and git commit dash m. This will be like uh, added, uh, let's say added a good day in the issue branch. Just just some commit to make sure that everything is set up. And now let's go to checkout master because I want to make some changes to the file on the master branch. Okay, for whatever reason it may be. Okay, I just need to show you what what happens when uh, we work on two different branches on one and the same file on pretty much the same lines. So let's move to the master branch. And now let's use once again to edit this file. And instead of uh, leaving it as is, how are you? Let's simply change it to, I don't know, like um, let's make it's a rainy day today. Okay, some, some other message, isn't it? 
some other message than what we've used in um, the issue branch. So let's save that. And now let's also add it and commit. So git add example, git commit dash m. And I don't know, like added rainy day to day message. Okay. And now once we've made the commit, let's try to merge this change on this branch on this uh, issue one branch. And let's try to merge it with the master branch. Okay, so just a quick reminder, we have two branches. The first branch is the issue one branch, which has modified the example.py file on the second line. And also we've done this kind of other change on the same file on also on the second line in the master branch. And now what we are going to do is simply to try to merge these two branches and to see what happens because that's guys as you may already guessed by now that's not going to be a trivial merge operation so let's first of all clear the screen and now let's run the merge command so git merge issue one and basically as you can see although usually git was able to figure out exactly how to automatically integrate new changes in this case, we got a conflict since Git was not able to determine uh, which one of the file versions should it take. So basically you can see auto merging example dot py conflict, merge conflict. Okay. And basically automatic merge failed, fix conflicts, and then commit the results. I mean, that kind of makes sense to get a conflict here because how can we know in advance what should be at the second line of this example.py file? Should it be like a good day to day message or should it be a rainy day from the master branch? That's something that definitely can be automatically decided and that's considered to be a conflict. Awesome. So I hope that's clear so far because we are moving on. We are proceeding with the content. So in this case, uh, what you're probably going to get is a merge conflict and Git will mark for you the file as being conflicted, right? This example.py and stop the merging process. It stopped the merging process and it will wait until you fix the conflicts, until you resolve the conflicts and then it should be able to move on. So all of that is basically specified by the Git output that you can see on the screen. So there is a conflict and whenever there is a conflict, we would like to resolve that conflict. And now if we will take a closer look, we will see something that seems to be strange a little bit. Okay. So uh, basically you can see that previously we were on the master branch and now it seems kind of strange. We have this, master and merging all together. So very strange uh, thing. Um, and also if we will take a look at the file at this example.py, let's use cat example.py. You will also see that its content has been modified a little bit and it seems to contain some additional information that we haven't seen until now this left arrows head as well as these equal signs and right arrows and then there is the name of the uh, the issue branch and basically there are two options for 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 the second line so print uh it's a good day today and also print it's a rainy day today isn't it so both of them are on the same file on the same example.py and that seems to be kind of new and at first glance even strange and complicated. Well, at least it was complicated uh, for me when I saw it for the first time at work and I didn't have any clue of <laughs> what should I do with this information at all. So guys, yeah, it can be really frustrating, but no worries. That's why you've taken this course to make your life easier and with fewer surprises and as much practice as possible. 
So don't worry, because all we can see right now is just some sort of a conflict representation by the Git system. And in the next video, since we have the conflict representation, right, we have this, all of this conflict representation, we are going to work together and understand how we can resolve this conflict. Because these conflicts usually are only for the fact that they have to be resolved and the work should continue and the merge should continue. All right. Awesome. So that's exactly what we are going to talk about in the next videos. So good luck, guys, and let's move on. And so conflicts resolution. So now let us discuss and talk about a few different types of merge conflicts that chances are high you're going to encounter sooner or later. And we can say there are two separate points where conflicts usually happen. The first one is when you start a merge process. And the second one is during the merging process itself, just like we can see here on the screen. So just a couple of words uh, about the first one. It is called the pending local changes conflict, which is simply a conflict at the start of the merging process. That's basically considered to be the most trivial conflict, I would say, since Git simply fails to start the merge even before it's getting into the depth of the merging process itself. You see, whenever your working tree is not going to be clean and there will be changes made in the working directory or there are changes in the staging area that were not yet committed, then in this case, Git will fail to start the merge since these, let's call it, pending changes will be, uh, will may be overwritten by the commits that are being merged in. And that doesn't mean that some other teammate has done something wrong or whatsoever. That simply means there are some conflict with pending local changes. And that's why in this case, Git will not be able to proceed with the merging process or basically it will not be able to start with the merging process. So if you have let's say two branches that you want to merge and there is a pro and there are let's say files that have were not committed uh, then this situation if you will run like git merge and the second branch okay let's call it second branch so in this case what you will probably receive is some message that says like something like this it will be like error and it will show you your local changes uh, to the following, to the following, to the following files would be overwritten by marriage, okay, of the file name itself. I'm not going to run this example right here because we are already as part of another marriage conflict, but that's basically something that you should uh, consider. Um, when you're going to merge and you will get like error message even before the merging itself started, that's going to be due to the pending local changes conflict. So make sure you handle this situation and that you don't actually have any pending changes. And of course, there are a few operations you can use that may help you with uh, with with this thing such as git stash, git checkout, git commit as we just discussed and also git reset. Some of them I'm not sure we are going to cover up in this course, though I think we'll talk about most of them. But still, just know about this type of merge process error that basically can be kind of easily handled. All right? Awesome. And now we are going to talk about the second one and proceed with our previous example that we started in the previous video when we tried to merge the two branches and got a conflict. Okay, that was the conflict that we received. And this is the information of the file that has the conflict. And now let's see in more depth, how can we deal with that? So first of all, this type of 
conflict is called the failure during the marriage. It's a marriage conflict called failure during the marriage process. So basically a failure of Git to complete the merge indicates that there is a conflict between our current branch, which was master, and the branch we tried to merge, which in this case was issue number one. And although, as we said previously, Git will try to automatically uh, merge these two branches, this operation will not always going to be successful. Okay, that's why you have to resolve some conflicts manually in the specified files that have the conflict, which is in this case is just the example.py. So the fact that we know that we have a conflict is one thing. Now let's try to understand how to deal with this fact. Basically, first of all, what I suggest you to do after you get this merge conflict is just run the following command git status okay and take a look at which files are unmerged between the given two branches and because uh, basically you see git is probably going to be okay with some of the files during uh, the merging process but there will be just a couple of points a couple of files where it's going to have some hard time to figure out how the merging process should be made there. So basically now you can see that Git lists anything that has merge conflict and has not been resolved yet, meaning it has not been fixed in terms of the merge. So you can see here uh, you have unmerged paths, right? And fix conflict and run git commit or, or maybe you can use git merge abort to stop that. You can see that unmerged pass uh, basically uh, is the example.py, which is the file that we need to take care of. And since we know that this file has to be taken care of, uh, does it mean that we have to go line by line um, and try to compare between every line in these two branches? Of course not. Git already takes care of a big part on our behalf. It adds standard conflict resolution markers, okay, which is, by the way, is a great tool. And Git also adds them to these files that having these conflicts. So cat, uh, what, what was the file? Example? Was it example? Yeah. So now you will be able to view these files and resolve those conflicts with more ease. So if you would take a look at the file content, okay, we will see that it probably contains these uh, sections, right, with the head and with the name of the issue and these equal signs. And the content of this file uh, is basically con contains some strange lines, which are also called conflict dividers. Okay, so that's the first one, the second and the third. And simply saying they are used to divide the conflict to give us useful information so that we will be able to resolve this conflict quickly. So first of all, this equal signs, okay, is considered to be as the center of the conflict. So everything in between the center and this line of the these arrows and the head uh, is actually the content of that file is it if it existed in the master branch. So basically this line of content relates to the content of the second line in the master branch. And everything in between the center, which is this one, that's the center, and this line, which is represented by these right arrows in the issue, is the content of the file that is currently in the issue two branch, which is our second branch, right? So that's the content of the second line in the issue one branch. Okay, so now when we try to merge it, we can see all the information of the target file, as well as the two lines, the, uh, the two options for this line that have the conflict. So Git does not know which one of these lines should it choose. 
Should it take the line from the master branch or should it take the line from the issue one branch? Okay, so that's how you take a look at this information that you can see with these new strange lines. So until, until this head, there is the information of the file that is uh, basically can be treated easily um, in the merging process and it corresponds to both of the branches as well as this message of print goodbye. The only problem is here, okay? So now that we know what we have to do, we have basically to specify git what exactly do we want to take out of this section to our merged uh, version of the file. So for that, let's open up this conflicted file. So vi example.py. And now all that we have to do is to take a look at these two options that we have from the two different branches and to decide with which one of them we want to go. So let's say that we want to go with both of these lines together instead of just uh, working with one of them. And let's say we want to work with them one after the other, kind of combining them together. So in this case, all that remains for us is just to remove the conflict dividers, which in this case is the head and also these lines, right? So let's remove them because we don't want this information to be part of the file itself, right? After we complete the merge, that's why we remove them. So uh, now let's save that. Okay. And now let's uh, basically once the file uh, has been edited, let's simply use git add example and also let's make the commit of this merge. So git commit dash m, let's say merged from issue one and resolved a conflict in example.py. Okay. And all this will do is simply to create a new merge commit to indicate that the conflict has been resolved. So let's see. And voila, you created a new merge commit. And basically, you're back to the master branch after the merge has been successfully completed. And if you will now take a look at the example.py file, you will see that it has exactly the content that you specified it uh, when you were resolving the merge conflict manually. Okay, guys. So basically, that's how you treat. That's the approach to solve uh, emerging conflict. Of course, there are additional tools for that, which may be a little bit more convenient that, than just looking at this information as is okay with this uh, uh, with these conflict separators but maybe we'll discuss about that in other videos all that was important for now is just for you to understand what is a conflict how it is created uh, and basically how can you solve and basically resolve a conflict and then um, continue and complete the merge and then basically after the merge is complete to proceed working with your project as it should so thank you guys for watching that's a very important video for your knowledge i hope you liked it and we will definitely see each other again in the next video so until then my name is vlad this is alpha tech this is alpha tech and I will see you, I will see you in the next videos. Right, guys? So until then, have a great day or week, whatever it is. I'll see you then. All righty. So we know about git status command and all the information it can provide us regarding the states of all the files that we have in our repository, right? We know the information it can give us and so on. So we know that git status gives us some information. Currently, nothing to commit, working tree clean. And now while the descriptive information it usually gives us is kind of great for beginners, and also for the time we just start working, start our way with version control systems, 
While it's great during this period of time, it may be a better option to get this information in some sort of more elegant and summarized format. So for that, we can use the short version, okay, the short version of the git status command. And it basically looks like this. So git status dash dash short, okay? Currently, we can't see anything because nothing uh, has been changed, but let me demonstra demonstrate to you guys a little example. So let's just see all the files that we have here. So we have hello world. So let's see hello world and add, I don't know, let's add just one line. So print, um, let's say hello world, goodbye. And hey, what can we add here? Hello world something like that okay <clears throat> so we've added a new line okay we've modified this file and also let's add additional file and call it i don't know my new file okay so my new file and simply add to here i don't know like something um print i'm a new file okay something very basic so that's what we've done, okay? That's part of our project. And it was like to edit this hello world and to also cr to create additional file. And now if we were to use git status, we can see that there is some information and uh, regarding these two files. And maybe uh, as we said, let's use some short version of this git status git status dash dash short so let's just clear everything from here so git status status dash dash short and now let's press enter and you will see kind of summarized and much more simplified information okay so it basically gives you hello world.py and my new file.py but what what has happened here what can we see what are these on red labels on the left of these two files and why only these two files are specified in the status itself basically on every line of this git status dash dash short or also you can use git status dash s flag if i'm not mistaken yeah it's the same dash dash short and dash s is uh pretty much the same thing one and the same thing and the output you can see is much more concrete and sort of straight to the point. Basically, on every line, you can see the file name, right, on the right side, uh, and the status of the file on the left. So, just a couple of shortcuts uh, that are being used here, and that it's kind of recommended to remember, or uh, like to use a list of this uh, until you memorize it. And basically, it specifies uh, some of the following information. This question marks, it simply specifies that these files, this file, I mean, is not being tracked by Git, okay? These are basically the files that are uh, added to the working directory and Git doesn't keep track of, okay? Maybe uh, we haven't done it so far or maybe we simply don't want to track it, whatever, okay? So uh, these question marks are simply f related to files that are in the untracked state. And we know that also if we use the git status, we can see that changes not staged for commit and also untracked files, okay? This is file, this file is untracked, but here this information is much more concrete. Awesome. Also, we can see here additional file hello world.py and we do remember that the what we've done to this file is simply to add additional line of code just to modify the file right and this m specifies that the file has been modified okay so hello world has been modified and my new file we don't know we don't keep track of okay so that's the concrete information Basically, I think you've got the idea of what the git status dash s gives you. 
And I mean, there is a lot of additional optional short statuses for any file. There is uh, what, what, what there is also an A, a capital A, which specifies the new files that have been added to the staging area. Okay, I mean added A. And of course, we are not going to cover all of them in this video, but still, that's important uh, that you will know about them and that this mechanism actually exists. Okay, it's important for you to know it. Um, <clears throat> you can always check this out in the official documentation uh, whenever you would like to. So if you want to know more about this short status, you can always ask for some help, right? And who is your best friend to ask a question about some git command? Well, that's probably going to be who? Git itself, right? The better way, the best guy that we can think of asking for help uh, regarding Git is the Git itself. So that's why I suggest you to use the following command. We discussed it in a lot of videos, I think, in be at the beginning of this course. So Git help status, okay? And if everything is uh, configured correctly, then right away you are going to see a nice and kind of descriptive information on your browser, let me take it here, on your browser regarding this command, including its various usages and various optional flags, okay? So options, dash s, short, branch, show stash, okay? That's something I think we haven't spoke about, long, verbose, um, basically a lot of interesting uh, things that you may also check them out. I'm not sure that for beginners that's the best way to like to know all of them, but at least know a few of them and especially the short format because it's very convenient to use it uh, when you're like using Git on a daily basis and a lot of times during the day and you modify, you add files and so on and so forth. So instead of using just the regular git status command, you may use the short one to see what files were changed, added, and like to like to get uh, a straight to the point uh, report. So just to quickly go over it. Uh, so <clears throat> we said that there is the unmodified. In my case, it was like uh, two uh, and to question marks, okay, so for untracked paths, you also have the M modified, as we just said, regarding the hello world.py file, the A for edit file, deleted files, renamed files, copied, updated, button merged, okay, so basically, you should, you should know at least the first five of them, that a file can be renamed, deleted, added, to the staging area, modified, and also a file may be kind of new or basically not get tracked by Git. So yeah, I think this is it for this video. If you would like to take a deeper uh, look, uh, you may always do so on your free time. Uh, I think that this information will be useful in different projects. So let me know if this command, uh, if if you're not new, let me know if you've used this command and also if you think that this command should be used on a daily basis or not. Maybe you prefer some other flags, some other options. So let me know this information. I will be really happy to know what you're going through in your development process in general and with Git status in particular. So thank you guys for watching. My name is Vlad. This is Alpha Tech version control system course. And I will see you in next videos and next chapters. Bye bye. Alrighty, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to an interesting video regarding Git log going further. So we know that we can view the commits history of 
any given repository, whether it's ours, uh, whether this repository is our own private repository, whether that's repository that we've been working with some teammates and whatsoever, right? Basically, we can simply do so by using the git log command and it will simply uh, list the commits that were made in this given repository in some sort of a reverse chronological order. This basically means that the most recent commits will show up first, right? Will show up here. That's the most recent commits. And the oldest commits will show up last, right? So here is 22nd of July. And basically that was um, the last commit, <coughs> uh, the, the, the most old commit that we've created. And here is the most recent commit. OK, so basically we know how the git log command works. We can also see the author's name. We can see the author's email, right? It's simply just the configuration that we've made uh, once we were setting up uh, the Git system. And also we can see that <clears throat> for every commit, we have an associative descriptive message that simply says what has been made in each and every commit, describing the changes which were part of the commit. So for example, here, the descriptive message is that we have added a .gitignore file uh, with some ignore rules. And some other descriptive messages associated with the commits were like added moonflight file and functionality. Another commit had like added motivation phrase. And basically, you got the idea, right? And to be honest, this command of git log actually has a lot of variations. OK, so there is git log. OK, and it has a lot of variations and is interesting usages that you actually may be interested in. OK, so that's why I want to dive a little bit uh, deeper into a few flags, a few common flags that are usually being used with this command. So the first interesting and important thing that you are probably um, going to use a lot from this point on is the dash P flag or the patch option. And it basically looks like this. So the command itself, git log, git log and dash P, or you can simply write dash dash patch if I'm not mistaken. So let's simply go with dash P. And actually, it's quite a useful flag because it basically shows the difference that was made in each commit. OK, so previously we simply um, we, we've simply seen uh, the commit history, right? Who made the commit? What descriptive message we've got here? Right. And so on and the date. And now if you want to observe the changes in some sort of also chronological order, um, if you want to observe the changes that were made between all of the commits one after the other, then you definitely should consider using this command with the dash P flag. So let's simply hit enter and see what it gives us. So let's first of all, just clear the screen. So git log dash P. And now you can see that this was uh, our this is our recent command uh, recent uh, commit. So let's just go down to the first commit that we had. Let's go down, 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 down. Let's see where it is. OK, so that was our first commit. And basically, you can see the differences that we had in this commit. So we simply created some new file. OK, new file. And the message was my first git using uh, first commit using git. And we simply had print hello world. And then in the next commit, we can see that basically what was changed is that <clears throat> there is also some um, where it is. Um, da -da -da. So there is a greetings file. And here we had the hello world file, right? So basically, you can see the difference that here we have also added uh, greetings.py if I'm not mistaken, right? And we added some information to it like print welcome. And here on the contrary, 
what we've done is just uh, we removed one line from the hello world and then we just added uh, two lines hello world and goodbye probably just by um, modifying the spaces and the new lines but basically what you can see here in um, this patch option is the differences between different commits okay between two sequential commits what was changed what was added and what has been removed okay so git log and git log dash p that's basically what what uh, all the information that it gives you and why i'm saying that uh this command may be very useful for you guys you see um basically you're not going always to use this command is um like to see the whole information between all the commit history but there will be times when you would like to put some limit on the number of log entries that you want to be displayed by this command so for example if you would like to display only the last three differences between the commits then simply just add git log dash p and dash three and this will simply give you a quick and descriptive way to browse and to take a look at exactly what happened between the last three commits so that's the last one that's one before and that's the third one so usually what you would like to do is simply to use it this way and to see just let's say um what happened yesterday what changes have you done like since uh, monday and so on so you know that i've made like two or three commits and these are the commits that i'm interested in so let's take a quick look you simply use use the dash p and dash the number of uh, commits that you want to view and that's basically what you are going to get and <clears throat> also another variation oops sorry also another variation of this command uh, maybe used if you're managing a project with a team or maybe you just want to review your progress so far and to make some assumptions about it and about the future then in this case you may also want to view just the commits in a given time frame okay so we know how to view a certain amount of recent commits and now i want you to take a look at all the commits that were made in a given time frame and basically what do i mean by that simply think of the option to use some time limits on the commits themselves right so let's say that you want to take a look at all the commits made in the last three weeks for example to make it like an overview of what you've done to your project during the last three weeks so in this case all you have to do is simply to write down git log and to use since equals to three weeks okay so for example three weeks and now if we hit enter basically i'm probably not going to see anything because the last commit was done a long time ago so let's go with better like since since um let's go like nine months let's go 10 months okay so 10 months and there you go you can see a list of commits done during this period of time which is also very very useful and of course there is a lot of variations for um for this command for this option of using like days months and even years okay so weeks months days and whatsoever uh, basically put some time frame that you want to view uh, what happened to your repository during this period and i think that's pretty cool <clears throat> all right so now let's say that we would like to have some other case when we would like some summarized information okay regarding each commit so we know that we can get a descriptive information we can get like just using git log without anything i mean like 
there is git log, there is git log dash p using the patch, there is git log using some time frame, but I want to get like a little bit of summarized information of what happened to every file. Maybe it was modified, a new file, and, and so on and so forth, okay? So in this case, what we are going to, to do, what I suggest you to consider uh, using, is the dash dash stat option. So git log dash dash stat. Also, you may consider um, basically using the dash dash pretty option to print the log output in some sort of specific format uh, based on some rules, but let's use just git log and see what it gives us. So let's first of all clear git log dash dash stat. Let's see what it gives us. So basically you can see also once again um, a full history of the commits made to this uh, project and you can see a little additional information of what has been added, what has been removed. So for example you can see that in this commit uh, something was added to the moonflight file and in this commit where we have uh, a descriptive message of added motivation phrase, you can see that we were um, talking about and we were dealing with the greetings.py file and one file was changed. We had three insertions, one deletion. Okay, you can see it also here in these pluses and minuses. Uh, and basically, this gives you also uh, additional information that may be useful for you as you keep working on your project because, for example, you want to take a look uh, what was done in the third commit uh, or two in, in the two last commits, what files have I changed, did I really change them and basically did I remove one line because let's say um, I think that in the greetings file I've modified it and I removed one line and I want to know what line was removed. So first of all, let's make sure that in this commit even one line was removed. So that's one way to do so, right? But there are also additional ways, uh, maybe also more useful to find, um, uh, to find this information, but that's also one of them. We may see here that this file had one deletion. So maybe in this file, we can um, take a look at what line was deleted. We also know that three new lines were inserted. You know, like it gives you a more descriptive overview of what has happened during the history of your project, uh, to of your project to your files. So I hope that's clear to you guys. I hope you get to some more um, solid understanding of using different commands. Of course, every command may have a lot of flags, a lot of options. And my goal in this course is to give you a brief for some commands and some commands to dive a little bit deeper to show you at least a few flags that you are probably going to use during your development processes. And um, yeah, this is it guys for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I will try to also add additional uh, document with all the commands uh, that you will not have to like to remember and to memorize them and you will be able to use them how however you like. So thank you so much for watching. My name is Vlad. This is Alphatech. This is Gitlog. And I will see you in the next videos. And until then, until then, until then, bye bye. Welcome back guys to another very important video and actually very interesting and if to be totally honest a very useful video, a very useful concepts, a very useful information that we will learn here in this short video where we are going to discuss and to talk about git aliases. So basically, why should we even consider creating Git aliases and not always using the straight and like the trivial commands as they provided by Git? Well, there may be a couple of reasons for, for that, but actually, in my opinion, 
The reason number one is that whenever you are developing something and working on some project for a long time, okay, a long time, big project, and also using Git for a long time on a daily basis and probably multiple Git commands a day, all right, then in this case, the usage of Git commands may become a little bit of exhausting. I mean, there are so many long commands like, um, yeah, you will see a couple of examples right away, but even even the, the short, the, the pretty much uh, the medium commands are kind of long and maybe, maybe after showing you a, a couple of examples, you will see the benefit of creating these aliases that can make the whole process much less exhausting with less words and less letters and just to like to get straight to the point with the exact command that we want. For example, let's say that uh, <clears throat> instead of using the common git commit command, we will be able to use something like a short version of this uh, commit. Let's say instead of git commit, we will be able to use like git ci, okay? Git commit will be git ci, okay? Some, some sort of a short version of commit that may be convenient for you. Maybe it's CI, maybe it's just, I don't know, C, T, whatever you, you will decide, okay? And maybe instead of using git branch, okay? Instead of using git branch, you will be able to use just git BR, okay? So I agree that it won't save you much time, but honestly, when your whole day is just like coding and writing hundreds and even thousands of lines of code, these types of shortcuts may actually become very useful. So the question is, should you be using it or not? Well, basically, it, it only depends on you and your needs. But if you decide that you should make some alias configurations for different common Git commands, that you're basically using on a daily basis, then let's take a quick look at how it can be done and then you will decide for yourself is if that's something that you want to master and to like to use on a daily basis or not. My recommendation and probably if you're, you've been developing for a little bit for quite a time, you will find this information very useful. So how it can be done? <clears throat> Basically, let's use the git config command and specify exactly what we need. So basically, it will look like this. Let me just write down the template. So git config, because we want to make some configurations for these aliases, dash dash global, dash alias, oops, dash dash global alias dot alias command, which is the nickname that we will use, okay, this alias command will be the nickname. And here we will use the actual command, okay, the actual command. So that's basically the template of the command. And we just have to remember that it looks like this. So git config dash dash global, okay, and then alias dot the alias command and the actual command that you've been using so far. So that's the template that should be used for creating um, an alias for different commands. So let's make, instead of the git status, let's configure that we will use, instead of git status, we will use like git st, okay? So git config global alias dot st, which is the new nickname, the new alias, and the previous command was like the status command, right? It was git status. So that's the previous name. And that's the new name, the new nickname, the new alias. And now let's hit enter. And basically, whenever you are going to use git st, it's going to show you the status, okay? Currently, there is uh, no information that we've added, but let's just create some new file. Let's make some um, touch new file that txt with nothing inside of it and git st uh, what what happened let me see hi so let's see the status once again so 
what what happened I'm sorry about that I think there was a problem with the git bash so let's just rerun it so git bash okay so let's go again git st oh okay and everything seems to be working correctly so <clears throat> basically uh, git st is now used as the git status I'm sorry um, that uh, we got this error something was uh, with the git bash it just simply didn't show the information so git uh, st is the same as git status so this st is uh, is uh, has been used as the alias for uh, the status okay so if we will take a look additional look at this command so git config dash dash global alias dot st the new alias and the previous command and that's basically how you do it for the git status also what we can do is also to configure uh, the uh, the commit command so git config dash dash global alias dot ci let's say the short of commit okay so now every time you will write like git ci dash m okay so that will basically be like git commit which is pretty convenient you just have to get used to it awesome so <clears throat> also um where also it may be useful okay is these were just some sort of short commands but basically that may also be useful where uh you have these long commands such as reset had dash dash right which is used to unstage a file that is part of the staging area so instead of going with all of this kind of nonsense command let's create a so-called new command called unstage okay so instead of going with all of this reset had dash dash let's simply create some command that will be like unstage and basically it will look like this so git config dash dash global alias and now the new name on stage and here we will specify the previous command so it was like reset had dash dash okay and now every time we would like to unstage a file then instead of using like git reset had dash dash file name right something like that so instead of using this we will now use git unstage a file name so it's even more readable and much faster and much clearer especially if you're tired on your uh on your uh, during your project so you want to unstage something it makes much more sense to use git unstage instead of this reset head la 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 awesome so also another very useful configuration that you may consider uh, to use is another alias for displaying the information regarding the last commit which is also very useful when you want to remember what was made in your last commit so instead of using like git log dash one head okay and seeing your last commit um so in this case it's kind of remembering git log dash one head remembering this syntax is not something that i um i don't know in some 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 case i don't uh, re really recommend it because i think we can create an easy uh to remember alias such as git config dash dash global alias and instead of using this git log dash one head we can simply use last okay last commit and instead of this command okay, head right so now when you press enter and now when you will write down git last you will see basically all the, uh, the information that you wanted for your last commit basically all the information that th this git log dash one head gives you okay it's much more convenient to use much more readable git last git on stage right instead of using uh complex <sighs> commands <laughs> okay guys so um once again if we finally want to summarize what git alias does is the following command so git config dash dash global alias new command 
new command. Okay, so we may also write it down and then specifying what command it should be like on uh, replacing. Okay, replacing a given command with whatever uh, you alias it for. So I hope that's clear to you. Also, one reason why um, I decided to do this video about these aliases is because there was a time when I've been working at some company, it was like at the beginning of my career, I think it was like the first or the second position that I've been working. And I've been sitting near a guy who uh, basically I, I, I had to learn from him. And he was like going so fast with uh, writing down everything he was doing. It was like, get last and then get on stage and, and get what wh whatever. Okay. So I was like, very, very shocked because I didn't understand exactly uh, what he was doing. What are even these commands because I couldn't find them on my own, right? You're used to uh, use this sort of trivial template. And he was like going so fast and doing all of this information one after the, the other. And I was like, wow, what, what is he doing? Why, why is this command even works for him? It, it's not in the documentation and so on. And then I remember I found out uh, all of these Git aliases after some time and I was like, oh, really? So that's why I want you to also be familiar with uh, the fact that there may be aliases in different commands that you use in Git and also in different other uh, system that, systems that you are going to work. But now basically uh, you can also trick <laughs> some of your colleagues and friends that are not familiar with aliases and then later on also tell them you've created these commands on your own and don't let them guess what's going on. <laughs> um, yeah, don't forget uh, and, go to, and don't go too far with that. Otherwise, this will be just frustrating. So uh, with that being said, guys, I wish you a great day, a great learning experience. And until the next time, let me know if you found this information useful, if you have any specific commands that you are using on your daily basis and you would like to use aliases for them. And until next time, I'll see you then. All righty, welcome back to another interesting video. And in this video, we are going to talk about how we can use uh, the remove operation and remove different files from uh, Git. We will see also a couple of options to do that. And also we will talk about what option is preferred. And basically we'll see the whole flow of removing and how it's being done. So there are a couple of options for removing files when working with version control systems just like Git. And let's briefly talk about a couple of them. So the first option to remove a file will look something like this. Let's first of all run the following command. So git git ls-files and this will show um, show us all the files that are currently being tracked by the Git system. Okay, and let's say we want to create some new file. Let's make it uh, newfile.py and this file will simply print, hi, I'm just a test file, right? Something like that. So save this file. And now let's simply run the git status. So there is this file. So git add new file. Let's just commit it. So git commit dash m and add a new file for testing the remove operation. Okay, just just a standard commit. I just want to show you everything that uh, be, is being done here. So press clear and let's start to talk about what we want to do. Suppose you would simply want to, let's say, let's just view all the files in the working directory. So ls will show all the files. So you see there are a couple of files and also uh, the build directory. We also have here the new file.py, which we've just created. 
And suppose you would like to simply use some delete option uh, and just to remove this new file that you've just added. So one way to do so would be simply to run the rm command remove and here to specify the file name. Okay, so rm and the file name, let's go with new file.py. Okay, this is this command is being run directly from the git bash. And now if we will run the ls command, we will see that this file was actually removed. So now if we will run the git status command, we will see that <coughs> we will see that uh, the file, okay, the new file is has been deleted, but it's under the section of changes not staged for commit, meaning this information is still unstaged. And if we will run once again the file, uh, this command, the git ls files to see all the files that are being tracked by git, we will see that this new file is still being tracked by git, although it has been removed. Okay, so that's very strange. Uh, very strange. It has been removed from, from the working directory, right? So basically, what what happened here? What can we see right now? Why is it keeps tracking the this new file? How can it be that it seems like we've deleted the file, but still the command shows us that it's part of the repository and Git actually still keeps track of? Well, it's not so difficult to explain what happened here. Um, basically, the deletion of the file has not yet been documented in the repository. The file was deleted in the working directory, but this change, this deletion, it has not been documented yet. We haven't told Git about it. Okay, so removed from the working directory, but Git is not aware of this operation yet. So that's why the next step would be to add this deletion operation to the staging area. So git add new file.py. Okay, and we are going to add it to the staging area. And now it's ready to be committed. And now if we will run, let's clear and run this git status. And you will see that changes to be committed and the change that we are ready to commit is the deletion of this file. Okay. Awesome. And even if this uh, at this stage, if you run the git ls dash files, it will still uh, it. Let me check. Oh, okay. Yeah, we we added it to the staging area. And basically, it's already no longer being tracked by git. Okay, very good guys. Uh, so you pretty much understand what happens here. Of course, you can also use the git commit like git commit dash m and now to make sure you uh, also have a descriptive message for this operation. So delete it. Uh, the new file dot py using the rm. La la la. Okay, so yeah, basically, that's how you do it in this first option. So I hope that's clear this two, three uh, steps process that we've just made. And also, uh, what you could what you could do is simply to use the git rm command. Okay, so previously, we used rm and a file name. And now you can use and then we added it to the staging area and so on and so forth. Now you can do simply the git rm. So let's make some vi, I don't know, new test dot py, new test two dot py. Let's say that it will be like test two. Okay, test two. And now let's document it. Yeah, git commit dash m new test two just testing out the remove operation testing out the remove operation okay so never mind about this descriptive message right now because i'm just recording it for this video and 
Now, once we are done with that, let's use git ls-files. So new test2 is being tracked by git. And now we will use git rm instead of just rm. We will use git rm. And this will simply remove the file from the working directory as well as it will add the deletion to the staging area. Okay, so basically it will do two things. Removing the file and adding it to the staging area, meaning it will uh, git will already stop tracking this file. So let's use git rm new test.py and now we can uh, basically do git ls-files. You will see that it no longer tracks this file. You will also be able to use ls and to see that this file is no longer in uh, the working directory. And basically, I think that you've got the idea of how this command works. So it has the two steps. Uh, just like previously using rm and then git add and so on. So if we will also use git status, you will see pretty much after what, what happened there after two steps. So git rm, rm and git add, you see the connection, you see how they work. And basically I think uh, that this concept is clear to you guys. Write down all the relevant nodes. Uh, that you want, like to remember the differences, to understand uh, the whole process of removing files. And just before we finish up this video, uh, I just want to let you know that this command is being used to remove usually all the files with a certain extension, some directories and other things that you don't want them to be part of your source code. So, um, so, for example, you don't want some extensions, let's say in your project, you don't want not to just to include uh, all uh, the, the .txt files to be tracked by Git. That's okay. This thing we can do with this um, git, git ignore file, right? There is uh, git ls files. You can see that you can specify uh, this information in .git ignore, but basically, maybe you don't want the .txt files to be part of uh, this repository at all, uh, this, uh, of this working directory. So, um, of course, to let git uh, stop tracking some certain files, we can do it in git ignore, as I just mentioned. And also, maybe some of these files were generated like automatically, the, the building steps, and I don't know when, and you would like to also to remove them. So one way to do so would also be like to use rm and like to specify all the .txt files in this current directory. And also, basically, there is a lot of usages. That's just some of them. So yeah, I hope that's clear to you guys. <sighs> now you should be familiar with different approaches to removing file in the working directory in general and from your Git repository in particular. So if you still have any questions, feel free to ask them and I will gladly answer you them as fast as possible. So my name is Vlad, this is Alpha Tech, and until next time, I'll see you then. So moving a file in Git. In this video, we are going to talk about how a given file can be moved in general. I mean, how a file can be moved from one place to another as well as how this operation of moving the file is documented by the Git system. And also, we are going to see a strict Git command that specifies that change, uh, this move, directly in the Git repository. We will see how it can be done. So I hope you're ready and let's go. So the first thing that we have to mention here is that we may have a couple of options for doing the move operation. The first option looks simply like this. So MV, the move operation, file old name, okay? The old name of the file. And then we will specify the file, the file, new name, okay? So that's basically the general structure uh, of the move operation, that's the standard. Um, basically, it takes 
the file and simply renames it in the same directory or moves this file to a whole new directory, maybe also using some other name in the new directory. But this command is not a git command. And the git system doesn't actually know that you have exactly renamed the old name file to the new name file. So let's say, first of all, we'll create some new file. Let's make like, um, I don't know, like hello mars.py and this file will simply print some print hello mars message. Okay, something like that. And we will do like git status to see that this file has been added. So I don't know, let's, let's simply git add hello mars right hello mars let's also commit it commit dash m hello mars has been added and also previously removed la 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 that's from the previous video so simply creating new file and tracking it we can also always see what are we tracking so git ls dash files right yeah so hello mars and let's just remove, uh, not, not remove, let's just move hello Mars to a new file. Let's call it move hello Mars to him Mars message, okay? Dot py. And now if you are about to check out the status by running the git command status, first of all, if you will run ls, you will see that the name of the file has been changed, right? This file from the old file name to the new file name has been changed. But now if you will run the git status, you will see oh, what happened, git st ah, status, you will see that git sees, uh, sees it as the previous file name was deleted. Okay, hello Mars was deleted. And another new file was just created. And it's even untracked by git yet. Okay, so we simply moved the file from one name to another, okay, using the MV, the move operation, but Git sees it as the following and it may confuse you guys and I don't want you to get confused, all right? So you can see here the deleted file, the hello Mars and the newly created file, which is untracked. And that may cause you some problems uh, with this understanding, but if you would like still to complete the moving action and synchronizing it with the git system, then for that we are going to do the following few commands. So one of the options is to use git rm and the old file name. So git rm hello mars. Okay, that's the first thing that we may do. And also git add the new file name just to let git track it and to add it to the staging area. So git add Mars message. So that's the first way to some sort of renaming a file using the git system. And although this will probably work, I do not recommend doing it this way or using like this approach. Okay, I really do not recommend it. But what I do recommend is using another way to do so. And this way is much simpler. Uh, it simply includes the usage of just one command instead of using this mix of three commands. And this command involves the actual git command that is being used to move a file in the git system. So let's just clear everything out and let's take a look at what do we have. So we have a Mars message.py file and we would like to use the, the kind of standard git move command. So it looks like this git move the old file name and then the new file name. So basically all this command does is just remaining renaming the file in git. So git mv, let's use Mars message to let's call it new Mars message. Okay, new Mars message, some some new file with new name. And uh, simply by doing so in just one command, 
if you will check the status right now, you will not see just like previously we've seen that this file has been deleted, this file is newly uh, and it's it just has been added and it's untracked. You will see the following message renamed okay so it's already staged and it's ready for to be committed and you see that this file has been changed and moved to be called just like this one so basically it's also staged we can see that this operation seems to be much more clear much more um useful with less possible errors and so on right and all that remains is just to commit the changes with just this nice message to explain this file has been renamed. And there you go, your renaming process, your moving process using the git system, the git standard gitmv command, okay? This gitmv command is now complete. So thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them and I will see you in the next videos. What is going on guys and in this video what we are going to do is simply to start exploring GitLab. So we said that GitLab is simply a service that allows you to host your project on a remote repository and basically it has um, a few, basically a couple of additional features that can help you in the software development lifecycle as well as continuous integration and continuous development. It has some features such as managing, sharing, wiki, bug tracking, and basically some of them we will discuss in this section, some of them not. So basically I hope you're ready and let's get started. So the first thing that we are going to do now is simply to go over, um, let's just increase it, to go over to GitLab. So GitLab, type down in Google. And you can see here a quick explanation and description uh, based on GitLab that it is uh, a web-based DevOps lifecycle tool that provides a Git repository manager providing wiki, issue tracking and continuous integration and deployment pipeline features, okay, using different things. So uh, here is also some information regarding the developers, but for now, I think that what we should do is simply to sign in or to create a new account on GitLab. So click on the first link. In my case, it was to the about. And you can see here a lot of information that you can get. Okay, that's basically the GitLab website. You can see here gitlab.com, at least for the time being that this video is being recorded. And now what we are going to do is simply go here and press try GitLab for free. Okay, so we are not going to explore it right now. We are simply first of all going to create an account. And uh, we have like this uh, free for 30 days account. So start free trial, two options we have here. Okay, and basically these two options describe how do you want to try GitLab. So. The first option here on the left is basically to access GitLab via a web browser, which does not require any installation from you. And here we have like GitLab self-managed. Basically you have to download and install on your own um, infrastructure or basically to use some additional configurations. But we are going to start with the most um, basic one. So click on start free trial here on the left. And now what you will see here is basically some form that you can fill to create an account on GitLab. And we have a couple of options here. Okay, we have the first option when you where you have simply to uh, specify your first name, last name, username, email and password. Okay, which is also nice. Uh, once you fill up these fields, you will get um, a confirmation email that you will have to confirm and then your account basically should be ready to go. Another option is simply to create an account using Google or GitHub and we are going to, at least for this uh, demonstration, I'm going to use Google. So press on it, okay, and now you will have like uh, specifying your email or phone. I'm going to go like, I don't know, let's use we, alpha tech. Okay, 
and use this kind of email. So show password, don't show it to anybody. <laughs> So we alphatech.gmail.com and next, 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 next. And now, okay, by registering for and using GitLab services, I agree to the terms of service and privacy policy. Okay, make sure you read it out uh, before you accept it. Okay, if you want to, to know what you are accepting, I read it previously, so I'm going to accept the terms. And basically now you can see here that your GitLab Ultimate Trial will last 30 days, after which point you can keep your free GitLab account, okay, forever. There is no problem to use it freely without paying anything else. But also there will be like additional plans that you can um, check them out and decide whether you need these functionalities and these features that GitLab provides you which are basically uh, will cost you a few bucks a month, I think, or you can always uh, proceed with the free option. So no problems with that. Uh, now let's fill up these nice fields right here. So let's go with this one. First name, last name. Okay, no problem. Alpha Tech and the company is going to be like, I don't know, Alpha Tech, Alpha, Alpha Tech Academy. I don't know, Alpha Tech Company. And number of employees is going to be like 1 to 99. Telephone number, okay, simply specify your phone number. How many users will be evaluating your trial is one. Country, country also select the country. Um, and that's basically should be it and you should be ready to go. Then press on continue. Once you pressed the continue button, we are going to simply here create the group name, your organization. Um, I don't know, let's create something like that. Um, my, um, I don't know, my uh, amazing group, okay? Let's see if it can be used. So visibility level, uh, there are a couple of options. Private, so the group and its projects can only be viewed by members and public means that the group and any public projects can be viewed without any authentication. So that's not a problem. Email, okay, basically you can specify here people that you want to invite, okay, to this group. So if you have like already and you know uh, which people should be invited to this group, no problem, press on it and select create group. Awesome. Congratulations, your free trial is activated. Okay, so <clears throat> basically here, uh, what we are going to do is to create our first project. So that's something we will leave to the next video. In this video, we completed successfully the creation of a new account on GitLab. So congratulations, guys. Your free trial is now activated and we are ready to move on to create our first project project. Alrighty, so now what we are going to do is simply to proceed with our GitLab setup. And now what we are going to do is to create our first project for this tutorial. And basically, we can see that uh, the, this project will live in your group, my amazing group. And the project is uh, where you house your files. Okay, so that's the basic definition of what a project basically is, how GitLab defines the project. So a project is where you house your files, which is basically the repository. And also the project is considered to like, uh, first of all, to have the repository and also to have like a plan of your work, like issues and so on. And basically where you have like your documentations and things, additional things that will be discussed later on. Okay, so simply go here, okay, you have two options, create or import. So create basically gives you the option to create a new project. And here the import, you can simply select it, you can take some project out of uh, GitHub, Gitbucket, Bitbucket, and many others and simply to import this project into GitLab. 
So that's an amazing feature that you can use basically if you already um, develop on some other uh, platform so uh, and you want to move to GitLab so this important thing is very very useful okay so now we are going to move to create and we are going to select the project name um, what should be the project name I don't know uh, let's make it my first vehicle okay vehicle we're going to create a simple vehicle. Oh, didn't I spell it correctly? Let me check this out. So vehicle, vehicle, oh, sorry, my bad. So my first vehicle is first project, okay? My project name, my first vehicle. And that will be the project URL, okay, that we are going to use. Now simply click on create project. So press on it, create project, and this will create the first project for us. So <clears throat> get started with GitLab. So they say we created a sandbox project that will help you learn the basics of GitLab. And I really do recommend you to follow up these steps that I'm about to share with you right now uh, before you dive into all the details and everything else. So let's see what it gives us, okay? So what they are saying, okay, that's basically, first of all, let's say the dashboard that you are probably going to use very often um, in GitLab. And basically, if you will take a look, uh, you can see here, okay, right here at the top left corner, there is these projects. If you click on it, you will see that uh, here you have like explore projects, their project in your projects, okay? And if you go to your projects right here, you will see that you basically have like two projects. The first one was the project we created just about a minute ago, okay? Which uh, is basically, is going to be used by my amazing group and the name of the project is my first vehicle. And the second project that was created kind of by default, okay, to help you learn how to use GitLab uh, to support your software development lifecycle, okay? So that's basically uh, a standard explanation of a project, okay, that if you will click on it, you will see that that's, that's the, um, the project that they want to give you to learn a couple of new things, okay? And basically that's the second project that you created, which is our basically uh, project that we created together. So what we are going to do in the next video, I'm going to talk at least for a, for a couple of minutes and to show you the the first project, with the, which is uh, this project that they gave, uh, that GitLab created for us uh, by default to help us get started. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of very important things, at least in my opinion, that you should be aware of just when you start using GitLab. And then we will move on to work on our current project. So stay tuned and let's proceed. Okay, so now what we can see here is basically the, uh, the GitLab kind of tutorial that was created for us. And we are simply going to briefly go over it and see what information, what useful information can we get out of it before we move on. So uh, let's read this readme file, okay? So they are saying that they prepare tutorials to help you set up GitLab in a way to support your complete software development lifecycle, okay? So there is a bunch of tutorials, okay? And each tutorial is contained in an issue and feature a task to complete, okay? We'll see right away, okay? So view these tutorials by clicking on issues boards in the left sidebar, okay? Complete each tutorial in turn by working through the open list, okay? We are not going to go over all of them since we already are going to see it together, a couple of them, but still it's very important if you're just setting up things on your own and you want like to explore it before you move on with uh, the instructor. So let's take a look at these issues boards, okay? So go here to issues, okay? This is basically the, 
the information you're going to see about the issues of a given project, okay? You will see here open issues, you will see closed issues, and you can see all of the issues that are there, okay? You can simply export it as CSV to, I don't know, to maybe to um, view them uh, locally, you can also import issues, you can subscribe to calendar, okay, and additional things that you can do right here, you can sort it, okay, sort direction, create date, last updated, okay, so basically you have like a bunch of issues, okay, are uh, related to a given project, okay, because this uh, is a project example of GitLab, and you can search by them. So what we are going to go uh, over here is basically uh, you can see here that there are a couple of options to view these issues and one of them is list, the second one is boards, okay? And you can see here that basically you have like open, you have to do and you have closed. And you can also see another option here like uh, labels, okay, by using these labels, but we are going to stick with these boards and to follow the instructions that they gave us. So what we can see here is basically uh, one issue that has already been uh, taken care of, which is to start the free trial of GitLab Gold, okay, no credit card is required. And what we can see also is additional issues, additional kind of task, uh, tasks that we have to do in order to set up everything and get ourselves started. And the first task is, of course, to set up your profile and set your status. So if you click on it, you'll see all the information related to a given issue, okay? So we know that this issue is open, okay? We see the owner. And we see the, the main title, we see what we have to do, like to set up your profile. And <clears throat> here is a quick explanation of what it, why it should be done, okay? So setting up your profile helps others in your team to get to know you better, okay? So sometimes you will work on larger teams, so that would make sense to like to specify your exact name, give some avatar, and basically your role, okay, some image that will uh, recognize you. And <clears throat> uh, so basically what you have to do is go to uh, the avatar right here, okay, click on preferences, and on preferences, choose the emoji and write something to describe your status in the current status section, and then update your personal settings as you wish, okay, in the main settings and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's basically the first task that you have to do. You can write down here comments, okay? And basically they uh, are going to be shown to whoever is related to this issue. And basically once you're done, you can simply go over here and like take it and drag it to closed. Very, very convenient. And this task should be over, okay? So uh, that's regarding the first task that we have to do, okay? Basically pause this video, go over it, and once you are done, simply proceed. Now what I'm going to take a quick look also is basically this uh, information regarding what's included in your GitLab Gold trial, okay? So let's open it up. And <clears throat> Your GitLab trial will be active for 30 days from the day you started the trial, okay? After the trial ends, okay, you will still be able to use, okay, there is no limitation on the free version, okay? You will still be able to use uh, the free version of GitLab, but take, take a close look here, without the premium features, okay? So the premium features will be removed now you can take a look at all of these others. Uh, so basically here you get to know uh, the help resources you have access to. You know, if we will open it up, we can see that uh, we can review, okay? So uh, let's start from the start, okay? So uh, they are saying that <clears throat> you have to, um, you have the access to multiple help resources, okay? And basically, um, what you should do first, okay, is simply to explore uh, the GitLab documentation and then you have like the community forum. And also you can kind of uh, ask for help from GitLab from some support, 
but I think that this support is only for for paid um, plans, okay? So just get to know the help resources that you can use. Here are some of them, so you better check them out also. And also, what do we have here? We have a task called create import issues, okay? So issues allow you and your team to discuss proposal before and during their implementation, okay? We already know it by now. So uh, you can use issues for a variety of purposes and for a variety of reasons. And um, yeah, I think that uh, it's very, very uh, important to understand how issues should be used, okay? Basically, we know that issues are always associated with a specific project. So you have a project, you have issues, okay? Some of the issues are regarding one thing, some of over the others. And basically, if you will take also a look, each issue can be, um, let's, let's basically go right here, okay, and see how we create an issue and discuss all of its um, information, related information. So select projects in the top navigation, okay, so projects, and then go simply to your project. And once we will see uh, the project, we can select issues in the left navigation, then create new issue. So we currently add the example project that they gave us. So we can simply also try to do it here. So let's go here, issues, okay? And here we can create a new issue. So click on create new issue and you can simply select a title, okay? You can simply choose the type, issue, incident and write some description regarding the issue. What is the problem? What do we want to achieve? what's not working, what, we're, what are we checking, and so on and so forth. Also, what we can also see here is basically who are the assignees, okay? Who do we want to assign this issue? What is the epic, okay? Milestones, if it's related to some milestone, okay? Milestones can be discussed right here. Milestones can also be created here. We have like labels, okay? So simply, if you want to associate it with one of the existing labels, so select it. If you want to create a new project label, no problem, simply do that. Wait, what, what is the weight that you want to give to this issue? And also specify the deadline for this issue to be completed, okay? Awesome. So that's basically a quick introduction to also how issues can be used. And you can see here that uh, this nice editor is really, really powerful. You can use a lot of things here. You can also attach files and um, yeah. Okay, so uh, you can also select it to be used like, so this issue is confidential and should only be visible to team members with at least reporter access. So based on different, um, different uh, options of access to the project, you can also put issues that are more confidential and issues that are kind of more publicly available to other team members. So that basically uh, depends on the, um, the access options. All right, so <clears throat> with that being said, let us move on here and go like, uh, where was it, to boards? And here at the boards, we simply checked everything out. We will not talk about this one right here. Um, okay, so create or import your code into your project or repository. We are going to see it right away in our own project, how it can be done. Set up CI and CD. That's also not for this step. It's a little bit advanced. I think that uh, it should not be discussed right away at the moment but you can invite your colleagues, okay? And this is also something we are going to do uh, right away. So uh, yeah, so you can also create and build your roadmap. And I think that for this video is kind of enough uh, regarding what we uh, were requested to do. And yeah, I think uh, this is it for this video, guys. Thank you so much. And in the next video, what we are going to do is simply to go back to our project and start working with it. So get yourself ready and let's go.
Alrighty, welcome back ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vlad, this is Alpha Tech Academy and we are proceeding with our course. So in this video I'm going to go over our project, okay, that we just created, my amazing group, my first vehicle. And I'm going to show you how basically we can work with it and different configurations that we can start with. So here where you can see uh, basically your project name okay you can see uh, a couple of additional very interesting things about it uh, you can see that you can start working with it okay by using these commands right here you can create a new repository by simply using a git clone to clone this repository uh, so I'm really wondering uh, what option I should uh, simply show you and um, mm -hmm. I am basically, basically, basically what we should use. Okay, so um, let's briefly discuss these options. Okay, so Git global setup, basically we know how to configure the name and the email and we know how to create a new repository. Okay, that's the second uh, thing that we can do. We can clone, okay, this repository from GitLab which is under this link, right? My amazing group, my first vehicle, and so on. Uh, we can change directory, create a new readme file, add this readme file and commit it and then push it back and then we will see like a, a one new file has been created. Uh, on the other hand, there is also an option like to simply to push an existing folder, okay? So we can, uh, if we have a folder that we have already been working on so we can create like um, to create like uh, to initialize a new git directory in this existing folder that we have locally initialize a new git uh, repository and uh, basically to configure that the remote will be like on this particular link that we have right here for uh, this project on GitLab add all the files okay to the staging area and then commit make some commit I don't know initial commit and push it back right here and then you will see like that you have all of these um, uh, all of these files that were previously on your working directory okay that you initialized a git repository added all, everything else committed and pushed it back to this project okay and also if you have like um, another git repository locally that is already uh, is being used as a git repository and I don't know maybe you're using it with uh, some other remote git repository such as github or bitbucket or I don't know whatever you're using so there are a couple of things that you can do you can simply uh, uh, rename the previous okay the previous configuration to be an old origin and you will add like a new you will add a new origin to be like of this type and then you will simply be able to work with this GitLab repository on GitLab so a couple of options that you can use uh, basically uh, if you already have projects so simply just pick the scenario that you have and decide on what commands you should follow okay a couple of options you have here Okay, <clears throat> so uh, with that being said, there are additional couple of options. Ah, by the way, simply notice here, okay, that you won't be able to pull or push repositories via SSH until you add an SSH key to your profile. And by saying so, we already know how and basically what an SSH key is. And I'm going to show you maybe not in this video but on the next video how this can be done okay so yeah with that being said okay what we will do right now is uh, um, basically instead of uh, cloning the repository what we will do is simply to start adding files uh, in one of these options okay so let's create I don't know let's create first of all a readme file okay so click on readme and now we are basically using the the web based um, application of GitLab and creating this new file called readme.md 
So in this file, what we are going to say is a couple of words regarding our project. And let's start with um, this project is a test project, okay, which is used, which is used um, for the GitLab tutorial, okay. And the project is regarding, I don't know, uh, some um, vehicle, vehicle uh, factory, okay. So uh, since we call this um, project like my first vehicle, this project is going to be regarding some vehicle factory. That's basically the first uh, information that is going to be used here, okay. So <clears throat> let's take a look right here. You can see that you have like an edit, an edit um, <laughs> sidebar, you have like this information regarding your project, you have like this review, you have like this option to commit branches, okay, if you want to use different branches. What we are going to do is simply to commit the changes we've just made, okay, so you can al always review the differences between the previous option and the current one and you can see like that four lines were created and here you specify the commit message and in this case I don't know um, let's say initial commit uh, including the general uh, general explanation explanation regarding 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 what regarding the project awesome so uh, now what we are going to do is simply click on commit and all changes were committed. Awesome. Now what we can do is simply to go back to our project. Okay. And what you will see is basically that our previous option is now kind of removed. Uh, there are no information regarding the things that we were introduced with, of course. All of them can be obtained, I think, from the GitLab documentation. Um, but now you can see that you have in your project called My First Vehicle one readme file, okay? And that's its content. You can always get into it and to take a deeper look. You can edit it. You can basically delete it, do whatever you want with it. But um, if you will take a look uh, here you can always uh, also see like how many co uh, how much how many commits this project has how many branches how many tags what is the files size and the storage itself okay so uh, yeah this was our first file created in this project and the first commit made during uh, this uh, editing on the GitLab web IDE. So thank you guys for watching. Keep on practicing and let us move on to the next video. Alrighty. So now what we are going to do is simply to clone this repository we created on GitLab. And once we do so, we are going also to add new files locally and to see how this information can be used right there. All right, so if we want to start working locally, we are probably <clears throat> going to need to add SSH keys, okay? So let's also click on it, add SSH keys. And basically, there you go. You can see here that we need like to generate a key locally and then to add it. So let's first of all um, go and close it up here and Let's start something, let's go like git bash here, or basically let's, <coughs> let's create this new directory, this new folder and call it, I don't know, first project, okay? And go into it, come here, come here, my dear, where are you, where is the mouth? Oh, here it is. Okay, so come here. Let's run here a git bash. Okay, so here it is. Here is git bash. And what we remember is basically where the SSH keys are going to be located. And that's 
going to be under the dot ssh uh, directory so if i do like ls dash la i can see that uh there are multiple keys that were used for generating um um during the the course okay so um what we can do now is simply to generate additional pair of keys so let's use the ssh dash keygen command and we will generate a new private and public keys and this key will uh let's call it id rsa and let's use gitlab okay that's it that's it and there you go let's see once again so there you go we created two keys id rsa gitlab and id rsa gitlab dot pub and all these keys are basically going to do is simply to be used um on uh, uh for the connection between our local computer our local machine local repository and the repository we created on gitlab okay so we don't want anybody to be able like to access our remote gitlab repository and do whatever he wants uh, to do there uh, basically not even to read and to write and so on and so forth okay so that's not something that we want but what we do want um, is basically um, to give this ID, okay, this public ID, okay, ID RSA GitLab dot pub, and to put this um, uh, to uh, this information on the GitLab server, okay. So what we are going to do is simply uh, let's use I don't know vi ID RSA GitLab dot pub. And it will open up all of this file okay all of this information so simply select it press on copy and now let's paste it right here on gitlab okay so the gitlab profile keys here is the ssh keys simply put it right here and let's um use a title here okay let's leave it as is you can set up an expiration 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 date uh, and there you go add key okay so a new key has been added to the gitlab uh, repository and what we need to understand is basically that now the connection can be or at least should be uh, able to be established from uh, gitlab to our local machine now let's go back to our project <clears throat> so there it is here is our project here is the clone clone with SSH and let's try to clone it and see if it will work so let's close it up okay clear and let's try now to execute the git clone command so it goes like this git clone and simply insert the link that you copied from GitLab press enter and we are going to clone everything right here so are you sure you want to continue connecting yes okay please make sure you have the correct access right okay so basically something with the authentication has failed so let's bring in a yes uh, la, 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 la. okay so uh it seems that we have some problem right here probably you do not have this problem but i see that this problem is um basically occurring for me right now so let's quickly fix it let's see if we can uh, basically use the ssh add to add these uh current id rsa gitlab okay so could not open a connection to your authentication server so mm -hmm, let's go eval ssh agent dash s okay and now let's add it okay identity added awesome and now let's try to go like this and da -da -da, git clone and see if uh, the cloning operation will work or not i assume that it will work but ee, that was a mistake why did we clone to this directory of the <laughs> .ssh no reason for that so let's simply remove this directory so rm-rf my first vehicle 
Yeah, that simply doesn't make any sense to clone it right here to the SSH directory. So we are going to go back and to go to our uh, directory that we created at desktop. And what was it? It was uh, first project, right? Project. What was it? First project. First. What was it? My first project. First git project. Now my first project. What was it? First, what, what was the, the name of the folder? It was first project. Okay, so let's go to desktop and now change to first project. Okay, so first project. First project. Come on. Ah, really? What's going on? Uh, first project. I sorry for that. So anyway, just to make it clear to you as of exactly what was done here and why things did not work smoothly right from the beginning, there was like one problem. And this problem was like that I already had like in different keys locally created. So I needed like to evaluate and to create a new agent of this SSH agent. And then simply to use the SSH add command to add this uh, private key to be a part of the connection so that whenever we will try to connect to the GitLab server to the GitLab repository, we will also uh, check and use this private key in order to encrypt the message and to send it over the GitLab server. And then we simply uh, gone to our working directory first project. Okay, this, this is an empty uh, directory, you can see it right here, here it is. And in this directory, we are going to use the git clone command to basically clone the uh, the project that we have on GitLab. So git clone, okay, and there you go, you can see that all the files related to this project are being downloaded and we can use them right from now. So here it is, okay, this is the git repository. Maybe some of you don't see it since it's hidden. But basically, here is the readme file, you can open it up, you can see what it contains. And yeah, basically, this is it, we cloned our first uh, GitLab project. Now what we are going to do is simply to add a new file to this first project. And <clears throat> what file, uh, basically, let's change directory to my first vehicle. Okay. And now what we are going to do is simply to create some new file. Okay, let's make it I don't know, vi so wheels dot um, dot I don't know, dot txt. Okay, and this file is going to basically have a lot of useful information for the we the wheels in this kind of vehicle. Okay, so uh, let's say this file contains uh, information regarding the regarding the wheels of the vehicle. Okay. And <clears throat> what we also know is that I don't know, we have like um, vehicles, vehicle, a vehicle, a, and this vehicle has like, I don't know, currently, it has Let's say it has like four wheels. Okay, size, I don't know, let's say 38. Just an example. So that's basically the file that we created, press WQ to save and to close the file. And if you will use now git status, you will be able to see like that uh, you have one untracked files. And also, you can edit. Okay, add wheels.txt. Now we are basically uh, added this file to the staging area, git commit dash m uh, added wheels information. And now what we can do is simply to push this information to the GitLab server. Because if you will take a look at GitLab uh, project right now at the repository, you will see that it only contains the readme file. Okay. And even if we committed it locally, it did not push it 
to the server, to the GitLab remote repository. And that's basically something that we can do right now. So um, let's use git remote and we see git remote dash v and you can see basically where it's configured to push okay and to fetch basically we said that if we clone something then this configuration of um, the url that is going to be used is also got configured so git push origin master and we are going to push to the master branch on gitlab server and hopefully once the push operation is over okay and it's over now we will be able to simply take and refresh this page and you will see that a new file has been added to the remote gitlab repository okay and you can also see that it has now two commits and if you will click on it you will see that here added wheels okay and you can see like added wheels information you can see this file contains information regarding the wheels of the vehicle different things added up and yeah so um basically you've done and added your first file pushed it to your uh project on gitlab and everything seems to be working good so far so good so thank you guys for watching let's move forward so i'll see you in the next video all right so now we should create a new branch for development and what branch should we use let's use git um let's use git checkout dash b and use here i don't know um engine development okay so <clears throat> what we will create in is a new branch okay that will called engine development and here we will use simply this branch to develop new tools and functionalities for regarding basically the engine so on the master branch we still have like the uh the wheels and here we will add engine awesome so let us create a new file let's use i don't know engine what do we have what files do we have we have wheels.txt so let's make engine.txt okay so this file is regarding the engine and we will say like uh, let's take let's take a look at the file uh, of wheels make them kind of similar so vehicle a so we are going to add information regarding the uh, engine for vehicle a so vehicle a has like engine i don't know let's make it engine super class i don't know plus plus okay <laughs> so this will be the engine of vehicle a and we will save it and now we will also add it so git add engine.txt git commit dash m and we will use like uh, added uh, engine functionality for I don't know vehicle vehicle A. And now all we have to do is simply to push this information origin. And where should we push it? Should we use git push origin or git push origin master or what do you think? let's try to use okay for those of you who do not remember let's try simply to use git push origin and the name of the branch so git engine um, development okay and see if it works okay so not all the commands you're going to remember but let's see now what happened so uh enumerating objects delta expressions writing objects and if we will take a look now here at here uh at the project on gitlab you can see that currently it has just one branch and what we are going to check out is if something has changed okay so this information you can see right here is basically the regarding the files that are in our current directory but where is the file that we just created this engine.txt you can see that it's basically it's not here okay it's not here and the reason is very simple since the branch is on master branch 
And if we want to see it, we can simply switch to the engine development branch. And there you go. You can see the engine is right here. OK, so awesome. And basically, you created a new branch and you pushed it back to the GitLab uh, remote repository. And there you go. Here it is. Here it is on master development engine. And before we move on, there is also something additional that I wanted to tell you is the fact that you can also, of course, use it as the way we did it right now. And also you can add and create a new branch right from this uh, dashboard. OK, so simply go here, click on new branch, select the branch that you want to create your new branch from. OK, so either it's master or some other branch like the engine development specify the branch name, okay, like new branch, and you will see that a new branch will be created. Okay, right here, uh, branch name is invalid, okay, without spaces. So new branch. <coughs> and once you click on create new branch, you will be able to see that this new branch has been created. And if you want for some reason to remove it, so simply go here, engine development, new branch, okay, and select on delete. And there you go. Also, you have a couple of additional options here, which are kind of nice, the compare option, you can compare between different branches. So source and target. Okay, you can compare between them. And also in the next video, we are going to see how to create this marriage request, and how we can use it. So thank you guys for watching. My name is Vlad. This is Alpha Tech. And until the next time, I'll see you then. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And in this video, what we are going to, to see is how we can create a marriage request. So if, for example, you've been developing some of your things on this engine development branch, and you can see the differences, especially here in this engine.txt file that is basically has four editions. Uh, and what we can make is create a marriage request. OK, so we are going to merge OK from engine development into master. OK, so you see the dashboard is really trivial for your use, for your needs. And the title that we are going to use here is uh, like, I don't know, added engine functionality for vehicle A. OK, that is simply good enough. Um, you can also write some description here. So this description, we are going to specify things that we've done, like, I don't know, um, tested, just 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 the general um, description. Um, I don't know, uh, not tested, but let's start with um, adding new functionality to the vehicle. And this functionality and this functionality includes the usage of a super, super engine plus plus. Okay, so uh, that's basically the description. In here, you can uh, set up the reviewers who will review this um, this merge request and set up different labels and so on and so forth. A setup who will uh, basically re approve it, okay, and then create a marriage request. Okay, so here is a marriage request. And if you're working with a team, of course, somebody else may also like kind of um, kind of uh, review it. Okay, so for now, we don't have a team, right? Because it's just a uh, um, uh, an explanation video. So this will be enough for now. And <clears throat> of course, here, uh, you can see like, no pipeline, and you may ask yourself, what is this add the dot GitLab CI YAML file to create one. So um, that's basically regarding the continuous integration pipelines, okay, to test your code. Uh, but that's not something I think that we are going to dive into it because that's a totally broad concept that can be discussed, I think, at least more than just one hour. So let's click on marriage right here. And 
hope that the merge will be a successful one. And there you go. Let's go back to our project. And we can see here that we have four commits. The last one was used to merge between the development. Okay, you can see also that the development by default uh, that this branch was removed. Okay, and if we will refresh this page, then um, basically you can see that the last the last commit was merge branch engine development into master. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think that this is it for this video. Okay, again, thank you guys for watching. Keep on practicing, keep on moving forward, and you are bound to succeed. I'll see you next time. All righty. So now what I want us to do is simply to talk about SVN. And this section is going to be compromised of a couple of videos, a couple of lectures, where I'm going to talk about SVN. I'm going to show you a couple of its main characteristics and its main features as well as we are going to talk maybe maybe about the differences and some comparison between SVN and other uh, options such as Git for example and in addition to that I'm not sure but hopefully hopefully um, what we will do is also to see how we can download a full explanation and demonstration, how we can download, how can we install and how we can get started using SVN. So I hope you are ready and yeah, let's go. So let's start with a general introduction and before we do anything else, let us talk about what is basically SVN. So SVN is an abbreviation of subversion, okay? And it's actually a very popular open source version control tool. Well, at least there were times when SVN was like really popular, okay? Now its popularity has really decreased, although there are still teams who use SVN thanks to some of its strength, especially over Git. Okay, so it was popular, very popular back then. Now its popularity has decreased a little bit, but still it's being used by some teams and it's being preferred over Git in some of its characteristics. Awesome. So now that we've made uh, this quick introduction to SVN, let's start moving forward. So at this point, we know in general what a VCS, okay, what a version control system is basically all about. And what we can say is that basically a VCS can be divided into two main categories, okay. The first one is the centralized version control system, CVCS, okay, centralized. And the other one is the decentralized version control system, or it's also called distributed, okay? We haven't covered up uh, much of the information regarding the differences, but I think that now would be a good time to do so. So, first of all, we can say that SVN is considered to be a centralized version control system, and it simply uses some main, okay, let's call it some central point, some central server to store all the files, all the versions and everything related to a given project. And in this section, we will talk uh, exactly about the whys and the hows, okay, of how it, how it does it, okay, how SVN basically uh, uses its centralized server, okay, well, not not sure that we will dive like into all the depth of the topic, but we will talk a little bit at least about the whys and the hows and even, even more uh, than quite a bit. But before that, uh, if you would like to get started and to get some feeling of SVN, you can do that simply by installing the SVN client the Visual SVN or the Tor Toys SVN, maybe with a simple combination with 
Visual Studio to get started right away. That's if you have Windows. And if you have Linux, the installation, I think, is even simpler. So if you want to get started right away, feel free to download and install it and start playing with it and running different examples right from the start. Maybe I'll also add a couple of videos to demonstrate the setup steps. Not sure yet. We will see about it. But that's the general introduction to SVN. Quick one, straight to the point. And now I think we are ready to move on. All righty. So in this part, what we are going to do is to briefly talk about the life cycle of SVN. And you will also see that it's very much alike and similar to most of the concepts we've talked about when we learned Git. So it has a lot of similarities. And basically, let us start with something very, very simple. Let us start with the repository. So a repository or repo in SVN is pretty much one and the same concept uh, as it is in Git, okay? It's simply the main place, the main database that stores all the information regarding the files which are part of the project you're working on, okay? So all of the changes, all of the information uh, that is part of the repository, okay? Basically, it keeps the history of changes for all relevant tracked files, versions, and so on. Okay, so pretty much the same functionality as we've seen in Git. Awesome. And another thing that I would like us to take into account is the create command, okay? Uh, this command, basically, all it does is simply to create a new repository. And maybe in the next videos, we will see how this command may be also utilized. But for now, I want you just to be like, to be kind of familiar with uh, the concepts and the workflow, you know, that is basically being used in SVN. So that's about the repository we just talked about. And now let's move on and talk about checkout. So at this point, we, we know what a repository is. And we also said that SVN is a centralized version control system, right? A centralized VCS. This means there is some central place, okay, where developers simply store all of their development things, right? And if the developers want to create some copy some working copy from the central repository, then all they have to do is simply one of the things, okay, is to use the checkout operation. Once their private workplace is ready, okay, they can start working on it, adding new files, modifying, modifying other files and deleting unnecessary ones. Basically, do all the changes that they want. And once all these changes are done, they can submit it back to the central repository. Okay, so what you do is simply you kind of uh, have a central place, a central uh, version control system. And from this central version control system, you create a copy of this central repository using the checkout operation. And you start working and modifying files and you're like working on the project. And once you are done, you will be able simply to submit it back. Okay. And the way you submit it back, we will see, uh, I think, right away. So now, you know, repository checkout. Let's move on. Let us now move to what it is. It's the update. Okay. So update, uh, since you are usually going to work probably right with a team on a project and probably not do it alone, then you will have uh, this repository, which will be shared by all the developers that can edit their files on their own and their changes. So by doing so, okay, just like we talked about in the second step here, where we talked about the checkout, and the modifications that you can do um, once you have like your 
local workspace ready. Uh, by doing so, once you add these changes, then your private workspace become older, okay, and not up to date. Meaning if you have like a team of five people and one of them simply updated something, okay, added their changes, then it means that your local workspace is out, out uh, up to date, right? Not up to date. That means that in the centralized server, there will, there will be like a newer version. So that's why you have to know the update operation. It's being used simply to update your local working copy and to synchronize the repository. So if, for example, I don't know, let's say we have like three developers, okay, one, two, and three, and we have like this, uh, we have like this central repository right here, okay, I, I don't know, I'm not the best in it okay so that's the centralized repository and each one of us each one of the developers had like yesterday or at the beginning of the morning had a copy of the repository i don't know there is let's say some file uh, which called like hello world okay and also he has the hello world hello world and he has the hello world so just one file and all of them have like one copy of it one and the same copy at the morning and if for example this guy decided like to modify this file okay so he modified it and he updated it back to the central uh, version control system the, uh, the central repository then this means that this updated file okay is a new file it's updated and the server or the repository here has the updated file since he committed an update um, not, not an update he since he uh, pushed his um, new newly updated information and each one of them okay of these guys he does not know that uh, the server has been updated and that their version of the file for example or some folder is not up to date anymore so one of the things they can do like to update it is to use the update operation okay so synchronizing the repository updating your working copy that's about it uh, regarding the update that i wanted to to show you we also used it in git what was it try to remember guys and with that being said let's proceed and see also this the it's kind of it's very similar to how Git can be used, but um, we just want like to be introduced and to be more confident about what is SVN. So let's remove it. Let's remove everything from the screen and now let's proceed. So uh, next we have like the pending change list. So you are editing uh, existing files by adding or removing some information in a given file. Maybe you are adding new directories, also an option, or any other change made in your working copy. So that's just like the, the staging area in Git, but there is no immediate update to uh, in the repository, okay? So your changes do not immediately appear on the central repository. Before these changes get there, they are added to the pending change list, okay? So one good way to work with pending change list is to use the status operation to list all the changes made in the working copy. All right, so now we have the commit, okay? After you've reviewed the pending change list uh, that we just talked about with the list of all the changes made in your working copy, then you may want to apply the changes from the working copy that you have from your local place, okay, from your uh, local working uh, space with all of these modifications to the central repository, okay? And the commit operation does exactly that. So once you commit your changes 
to the repository, okay, since it's centralized, all the members will be able to see these changes simply by using the update operation that we just talked about to update these changes in their own working copies. So uh, yeah, I think that's enough regarding the workflow. Of course, we can dive more into it, okay? I think we've covered up pretty much all the basic terminologies and usages, and that's pretty much everything necessary to get ourselves started with SVN. So yeah, you've seen that a lot of things are pretty much the same as using Git, okay? And the concepts are very similar, although there are major differences, but some of them are, some of the concepts are really uh, alike. And if you are interested in knowing more about SVN, you can always read its official documentation, uh, its command in practice and so on. But since that's not a major player in our version control system course, I think that Maybe, maybe I will uh, add this video of just download and install it and see how these basic commands will be in practice, okay? So thank you guys for watching, keep on practicing. We reached the end of this video and my name is Vlad, this is AlphaTech and until next time, I'll see you then. So you probably know by this point uh, that there are similarities and there are differences between Git and SVN. And the first difference is that Git is a distributed version control system, while SVN is a centralized one. But there are also additional differences that we are about to discuss in this video. So Git versus SVN, I think it's a good time to get ourselves started. Let's go. So uh, let us start with um, the feature comparison right away and start with the first one called the architecture of the server. So well, what about uh, the Git architecture? Basically, any Git workstation acts as both a client and a server. That means that everybody can have its own local copy of the files, including the full version history of the whole project. Everybody can make his own changes, okay, locally to add new files, change data, delete files, and so on. And there is even no need to actually be online and to be connected to anything else all the time, right? You can work locally, make everything you need, and then share this information with your colleagues. And now regarding the architecture of SVN. SVN has a separate client-server architecture. Usually, if you want to, if you want even some part of the work to be done and you want to make some changes, then you must be online all the time, connected to the server and working with it. So that's the first one, uh, the first feature comparison, let's say, in our Git versus SVN video. So that's the architecture of the server. Client server does not usually require you to be online. <coughs> while Git, uh, while SVN works a little bit differently, okay, since it's centralized and yeah. So with that being said, let us move to the second one and it's called storing repositories. So Git architecture may be great for some things while not so great for the other. You see guys, whenever you're going to work on big projects, there may be times when you will have to deal and to store large files, maybe binary files and maybe other files, and you will need some way to store them. With Git VCS, it's not so optional. And the reason for that is very simple. You see, if you store very large files as part of your repository in Git, then in this case, each and every one of the teammates is going to have to wait for a long time before he or she 
will be able to check out the full repository onto their computer. And every time that these files will get changed, okay, then this whole process of synchronizing and downloading them will occur and it will be like really long again and again and again, okay? So even slightest changes in these like massive files may result in a long process of cooperation. And that's totally something that we don't want. That's not so practical, I would say. And it will simply reduce the performance, okay, of using Git. So I hope that's clear to you guys because that's a very important point, okay, regarding the usage of Git with large files, okay, and why uh, the performance will be um, will be lowered. And of course, there are some workarounds that can be used, but we will not discuss that right away. All right. So what about SVN? Okay, how does SVN deal with large files? Basically, the SVN system works a little bit differently about that. And checkouts take uh, the, the checkout operations take much less time when there are lots of changes in large files. Okay, so whenever there are large files, and you know that there are going to be like frequent changes. So I think that SVN here has the upper hand. So that's why we can say the SVN architecture may be preferred for working with large files in terms of performance. All right, guys. Awesome. So now let's move on and talk about branching. So while the Git branches, uh, while the Git branches structure is very efficient and it works with references, the SVN branches structure is not the most effective model. Okay, so Git probably will win here, but let's try to take a look, a deeper look at what exactly do I mean. So you see, the Git branches are light and powerful, and they typically allow you to work on any branch at any time. For example, if you want to fix some bug or to check out if this new feature you've been thinking about is of a great use, then in this case, you can simply create a new branch, make all the relevant changes, and once you're done, you may either merge it to the master branch or not merge it at all, and then simply to easily delete the branch itself. But with SVN structure, okay, the structure itself and the way of working is much different, okay. The SVN branches are uh, branches, branches. The SVN branches are real directories. And when you're going and, and when you're done working on a branch, you go and commit it back to the trunk. And probably you're not the only one who does that and who wants to merge their changes. That means there is a high possibility for conflicts, file overrides, for example, and so on. Not to mention the fact that if you want to deal um, to deal with this kind of conflicts, it also takes may take a lot of time. So the branching structure of Git is definitely preferred over SVN, usually most of the time, okay? And finally, what we have is the access control. So that's a question of what one prefers, okay? Git provides by default to all of the team members and access to pretty much all the resources with the same permissions. So simply saying there is no actual access control in the native Git, okay? Although there are additional tools that can be used as add-ons for that, uh, but you know, like we will talk just about the default, okay, configuration. So that's about Git. And regarding the SVN access control, it basically gives you the ability to specify different access controls for different resources. So to summarize, based on your needs, um, 
you can decide which one is better choice for you in terms of accessing uh, of the of terms of access control. Okay, so that's about it. And what also do we have here? We have the backup mechanism and the repository history. So since SVN is a centralized version control system, then all of the interesting things actually happen on the central server. So if you would like to make any change to the repository, okay, uh, basically to the repository's history, then what you will have to do is to access this server, this central server. That's why I think it's a good practice also, uh, although there are uh, tracked changes on the server at the file level. Even so, I do recommend to make regular backups. I think you don't want to get into a situation where your server for some reason may crash and you did not have any backup copy. All right, awesome. So that's about the SVN. Now let's talk about Git. And we know that Git is a distributed version control system. And that's why anyone basically can change any part of the repository's history locally, okay? And although making a push of a changed repository history is highly discouraged, and also since the changes in Git are tracked at a repository level, this may happen. But regarding the history and the backup of the repository, that's basically something that happens every time any user or developer clones a repository. That's why um, we will have a local copy of the repository every time we are going to work with it, right? Using, for example, the clone operations and so on and so forth. All right, so in terms of backup mechanism and repository history, I think that Usually Git is preferred, okay, like every time anybody can see the full uh, history of the repository, uh, always there is a nice backup, at least at, uh, on the, the developer's local side. Okay, and not like everything is centralized in just one place. I think that I will get Git here, at least in most of the usages that I currently do. I will give Git uh, additional point here. Okay, so finally, let us talk about the last one and that's user friendly. Basically, if you're a beginner or not even a programmer, then you may consider using SVN to keep versions of different files you're working on. These files may also be not related to code at all, okay? So it can be said that SVN is being used more often by non-programmers and may also be considered as a little bit easier for beginners. On the other hand, there is Git, and although uh, both of them use the command line interface, okay, the syntax of Git commands is considered to be a little bit more difficult to grasp at first, especially for beginners. Hooray! Awesome, so we reached the end of this video. Now let's maybe do a little, a little summary. So, as you guys seen from our comparison, there are things which may come in favor for SVN, while there are some other things that may be better when using Git. Some of the most common um, reasons why Git is considered to be more popular and used than SVN is due to the fact that it's better than SVN at the branching, st branching structure, as well as also SVN is not considered, at least not in my opinion, to be a great tool for automations and DevOps. And while there are some better options than SVN in many terms, uh, we are not going to cover more of that in this video. So basically, um, is one better than the other or preferred over the other? It's up to you to decide and based on your needs, guys. I think that you can always compare like for yourself, try to work with it a little bit and find your best friend and your best tool for the next of your development process. 
So simply saying, once again, you can always take some time and make one, two projects using both of them and then writing down some uh, advantages and disadvantages for each one of them and to make some conclusions based on the process and experience you had and then to, to choose one of them or even to choose both of them. I don't know, maybe you can make some mix between them and to move on. So that's usually the best approach to experiment something and coming up to a based conclusion. Thank you guys so much for watching. We reached the end of this video and until the next time, I wish you great time. Okay, keep on practicing, keep on learning new things and you are about to succeed. My name is Vlad, this is AlphaTech. I'll see you on the next videos. Alrighty, what is going on ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to another very interesting and very important video in our course. And in this video and basically in this section, I decided uh, to add a full demonstration of working with subversion SVN. And to summarize, basically what we are going to do now is first of all, to download and install subversion. I'm going to show you what website I recommend or at least I use. Um, we are going to see how everything can be configured, how we can create a new repository, how can we create a new project and basically how we can work with everything together, together um, using SVN. So we are going to take a look at a couple of things, a couple of commands, a couple of usages. So yeah, I think there is pretty much enough things that we can cover up in this section starting from now. So get yourself ready, prepare for download and install configurations and starting to work with SVN and yeah. So good luck guys, I'll see you in the next video. So let us start with the download and install process of the Tor Toys SVN, which is simply a client, okay, an Apache subversion client implemented uh, as a Windows shell extension. And just to let you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it will work uh, both on Linux and or Mac on Mac OS. Not sure, never tried it, I never like got into all the details, okay? But I think that it's mainly mainly useful for the Windows operating system. Although there are a couple of alternatives as far as I remember for Linux and Mac OS users, but still this video uh, does not regarding, uh, is not regarding uh, the cross platform and will it work or not, it's just simply going to be tested out and demonstrated how you can use Toys SVN on Windows. So with that being said, let us go here to, let's jump down uh, right to downloads. So here we are at downloads and basically you have a couple of options here. There is the Toys SVN 32-bit and there is also the 64-bit um, operating system version. So Choose whatever version you need for based on your architecture and simply click on it. Once you click on it, you will have like to save this version. Okay, so there you go to another page and your download should now start. Okay, let's simply minimize it a little bit. And instead of saving it in the download, I will go like to my directory that I already prepared. And I'm going also to create like, I don't know, um, let's make maybe SVN installation. I'm going to save it right here. You can save it in another folder. No problems, right? We know nothing to worry about so far. So good. Um, just that you will know uh, at what website we are downloading in it. The download itself, at least as far as I can see it, is the osdn.net projects and so on. So we were previously at the tortoisesvn.net, okay? Then we got to the downloads and downloaded everything uh, that was necessary for us. 
Awesome. So now let's go to this folder. Okay, now we downloaded it once. We don't need it twice. So show in folder and let's take this folder right here that you will be able to see it. Now, uh, here is the file for the installation of the Tortoise SVN. So click on it and we will simply get this nice setup wizard. Uh, press on next. Okay, here is some are some license, no warranty. Okay, next. Uh, here are a couple of options. Uh, let's go also and enable, okay, the command line tools. Maybe I will talk about it, maybe not. Not sure about it yet. Let's see how things will go. Okay, so press next and press install. Press yes. Okay, this icon will jump. Press yes. And let's wait until these tortoise will finish its setup thing. So completing the tortoise SVN setup wizard, click the finish button to ta ta ta. Okay, you can always donate. Okay, that's also a good share, a good a good thing to do. So finish. Okay, and basically now the installation is complete. To be honest, I don't think that we need this uh, installation file anymore. We can always delete it. Awesome. So now the installation process is complete. And basically what we are going to do now is maybe, yeah, let's start with a simple example, shall we? So for this example, what we are going to do is just, let's first of all, create a new directory. Okay, let's create this new folder and call it, I don't know, let's call it uh, project reposi repository. Okay, and this folder will be used as the repository, okay, for this uh, SVN, okay, it will be kind of our um, main repository that we will use it locally, okay, not on some remote server, but locally because, uh, yeah, it's much quicker and much easier for us to demonstrate in this example. So right click on the directory, go to Tortoise SVN, here set up create repository here, okay, and it will simply take this folder and make it like a repository. So you will get like this message repository created in the exact location where it's going to be created. And uh, you can create a folder structure. Do not bother about it right now. Simply press OK. And now if you go into the folder inside, you will see a lot of things uh, created here. Conf, you will see like DB, you will see hooks, you will see locks. Okay, but don't mind about it right now. Uh, probably we are also not going to dive into all of these details uh, since, you know, like it's not a beginner friendly and it's pretty much intermediate or advanced topics. So go one above and you will see also that the icon itself has changed. Okay, has changed at least at this resolution, maybe at this also. Let's see. And this resolution, it's still the same. Okay, so never mind, leave it as is. Okay, project repository is now created. Now, the second thing that we are going to do is that we know that here is our project repository. Okay, we, we don't care about it. We will not touch it like directly. But what we do care about is creating a new folder that will be like, um, called like, hello world project. Okay. And this project is going to be very, very simple, very intuitive. Uh, here we will like create a couple of files that we will use during the development process of our project. Files such as I don't know, let's make um, let's make a file and let's make a file and call it like, uh, good morning. Oh, I don't know, let's call it Hello World. Hello world and add it with an extension of .py. Okay, let's make it like uh, a Python file. For example, yeah, it's nothing complicated. Don't worry about it. It's just a simple, uh, a simple command that I'm going to use for this file. So let's simply go press on it, 
click edit with notepad plus plus or edit with notepad or whatever you're using come here come here get in here okay and now let's make I don't know some command some simple command print hello world okay or better say let's make it hello beautiful world okay awesome nothing complicated guys for those of you who is not familiar with Python okay that's basically a simple command that takes some text and put it on the screen that's it okay a simple program awesome so we created this file this first file and now what we are going to do is simply to specify that we first of all want to track it and to put it and to be part of our repository okay so how should we do it and that's not so complicated to do but before that there is something that we need to do first okay we need to somehow connect this hello world project and the project repository okay like to make them connected and how should we do it let's first of all assume that the hello file uh, world file was not in this hello world project okay so that everything will be okay so that's basically the first um, step that you should start before creating the file itself I just wanted to like to take it at a little bit different route to show you what we are doing so we came to a uh, to a point where we wanted to like to put uh, a project files to be like part of this subversion repository but we could not do it since they are, were not connected so the next thing that we need to do is simply to connect between them and one way to do so is simply go here okay copy this path okay of the project repository then go to hello world project right click on it and then here use the SVN checkout so press on it and a little pop-up should open up and you will see like this nice message right here so uh, leave this file and dashes here everything leave as is simply modify this path starting from the C okay C users la 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 and what we are also going to modify in case that matters this forward backslash slashes so I take it like that okay so everything seems to be working exactly as we planned so that's the URL of the repository okay and you can see it project repository and here checkout directory which is basically going to be the directory of the project that we are going to work there on different files and so on and so forth um, yeah so uh, press on OK and basically you will see that the checkout has been finished completed okay no problem okay so now if you go into this file once again you will see like this .svn hidden file some of you will not see it some of you will that basically depends on the configuration of if you can see hidden files or not we are not going to dive into all of the details about it right now simply notice that this file was created and now uh, it's kind of attached to the SVN repository okay this working directory hello world project is now somehow attached and connected with the SVN repository Whew, awesome so now next 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 let's get this hello world.py file back inside okay just like we um similar to the fact that we just created it okay we just created it no problem okay awesome everything seems to be great and now if we right click on it okay on this hello world project you will see that you have a lot of options here uh, under the tortoise svn okay so we have like show log repo browser check for modifications revisions graph resolve update revision revert clean up and so on switch merge export relocate a lot of options right shelf unshelf and so on so what we are going to do is first of all to let's see uh take a look at this show log 
So you can see that no logs were uh, basically like um, uh, logged yet, okay? Because we haven't specified any specified anything so far. So what I want us to do is simply go right click on it, go to Tortoise SVN, and simply hit this add button, okay? Add. And that's going to show you all the files that we are going to add to the next step. What was it? Pending what? Okay, remember, go go check the previous video if you forgot. So now press OK. And there you go, you can see that this file has been added to the pending change list. Uh, and yeah, okay, so uh, okay, press OK. And now, what we also have to understand is the fact that Although it has been added, okay, although it has been added, you can't see anything interesting right here in the log. What we have to do it to complete it is um, to understand that we need to commit it, okay, uh, after we added it to the pending change list, okay, you remember what it is. So let's simply commit it. And where is this commit button? Where it is? Here it is, SVN commit. And there you go, you get this nice little um, screen. You can see that we are going to commit to this repository that we just configured. Uh, and also we can see that the changes made, okay, uh, are right here. And you can see the difference between the files, okay, by double clicking the file for differences. Also, uh, you are requested to attach some associated message describing the changes you've just made. So a nice message may be like um, added first hello world printing message. Okay, it's not hello world, it's hello beautiful world. Okay, hello beautiful world printing message. Now press on OK. And there you go, sending content, committing, completed. OK, revision one. OK, so now basically we know how to add and commit a new file in a new project to a repository to SVN repository using SVN tools. So thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. And I think that we may move on. All right, so now what we are going to do is simply to proceed talking about SVN and taking a look at a couple of its features, functionalities, usages, uh, whatever you call it. So we are going to maybe create additional files, compare between files, uh, add them, commit them. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So get yourself ready because here we go. And the first thing that I want to do is basically go here to our uh, Hello World project and open up uh, and create maybe a new file. Let's create some new file, call it, I don't know, goodnight.py, okay? This file is going to be, again, a Python file simply to print a good night message. So let's edit it with notepad. Here it is. Let me open it up. Okay, and the content of this file is going to be like print. Um, have a good night message. Okay, that's it. That's all this program is going to do. So save it, close it. Let's even not close it, but put it here. But we saved it, closed it basically. And yeah, there you go. So you created additional file called goodnight. And now what we want to do is simply to see what basically we can get, what information can we get out of this tortoise SVN show log. So let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, so previously we can see that revision one uh, action added and there is this date, right? There is the associated message to this commit when it was done, also who is the author. And yeah, so that's what happened then, okay? And now what we want to do is 
simply to add this second file. So let's take a look and let's see what 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 additional functionalities may be useful for us at this moment. Um, <laughs> what is check for modifications? Okay, check for modifications showing you a couple of interesting things. Okay, it's showing you the path to some file. Okay, status not versioned. Okay, no versions uh, exist to it yet. Okay, so but it see it appears to find it a little bit uh, different and not at least not familiar. So what we are going to do is to go here and press on add. Okay, and what we are going to add, we know that it's pretty much what has been changed or at least not tracked. So goodnight.py is this file. We are going to press yes. Okay, okay, awesome. Now let's also commit it. Let's commit this file and add like uh, added a um, goodnight message. Press on okay. And basically, there you go. We created a second revision of the file of the project. And now we can also take a look at it like using this show log and we can see basically in this show log we can see the revisions, the actions, the date that each one of these commits has been um, cre uh, made. And we also can see why this specific commit was made. So the first one was like to add a first hello beautiful world printing message. And the second commit which was made about 10 minutes after that was simply uh, to add a good night message. Okay, so as you go and as you develop your project, you are going to see the exact pretty much steps that you've made in order to like to come from uh, point A to point B. Okay, you are also going to see who made these changes, who made these commits. Okay, if you're working with a team, then maybe <clears throat> uh, your repository is somewhere remotely and your team, each one of your members uh, on the team is like committing everything and you will see like, okay, so I have like Mike made change number one, uh, Daniel did change number two, I don't know, Stephanie did change number five. And <clears throat> that's basically how you do it. Awesome. So one thing, additional thing that you can see is that whenever you click on each one of these commits, you will also see the changes and basically what was done during this commit on this particular file. So good night was added and hello world was also added. Okay, so that's kind of nice to know. So yeah, let us proceed with additional progress in this SVN tutorial. Okay, so what I want us to do now is simply maybe to modify, okay, to modify a little bit, both of these files. So let's open them up, edit with notepad. Okay, and let's modify the good night and add, I don't know, uh, have a good night and also add another message like, uh, and sweet, sweet dreams. Okay. And also let's add here like, I don't know, um, some message. That's simply a comment, a comment on this file. Um, what it will be, this file is used to, um, to display good night messages. Okay, so we modified good night. Now let's modify the hello world. Hello beautiful and fantastic, fantastic world. Okay, we are very optimistic today. So that's why we do it this way. Okay, so now save this and you may also close it and go here and press right click on it. Go here, show a uh, log. Okay, that's the previous log. Now you can go also and press here on uh, check for modifications. Let's see what happens. So uh, you can see here a couple of things in for uh, information regarding the modifications made probably. Okay. 
So what we are going to do is maybe right click on it, Tortoise SVN, and let's see what we can also uh, get here, what information. Let's see what it will give us if we press here the properties, okay? Nothing of value, right? I'm trying to explore it together with you. And if we will go like uh, here and go like once again check for modifications and <clears throat> let's see um, what what it will give us if we go here like show differences as unified diff, no. Let's compare it with base and let's see what it will give us, try to understand what it is. So here we have like this compare with base and we can see on the left some file called goodnight working based revision 2 and here we have goodnight working copy okay and also the same file but something else so what basically can we see right now on the screen we can see kind of two revisions of one and the same file on the left you can see the file that was previously committed and part of all and is already part of the repository okay that was like the working base, uh, the good night file, which we had like this nice message printed out previously. And on the right, you can see like the same file in the working copy where we simply modified the content of this file. We added like this comment, like this file is used to display good night messages. So print, have a good night and print and sweet dreams. So these things were uh, simply added to the file, but they are not yet have been uh, committed to the repository. Okay, so I hope everything is clear. And here you have a couple of options like to uh, for to make this comparison. So why basically this comparison is useful? Very simple because before you will um, you will decide to add something to the repository or some changes that you've made, for example, to this file. A good option would be to take a look at exactly what was changed, okay? And basically, that's what we can see here. These are the changes from left to right. A couple of options that you can use here, but never mind it. I think that it's pretty much enough uh, of what I wanted to show you. And if you press the same on Hello World, we also expect to see some differences. So compare with base and you will see this is the previous. It was at revision number one. This file was committed to the repository. And here on the right, you will see the updated message. Okay, so print Hello Beautiful World. It was previously and fantastic has been added. Okay. Once again, let's take a look at this one. You will see like previous and current files. And uh, also what I wanted to show you is maybe this uh, kind of option, show differences as unified diff. Okay, it will show you uh, the differences in kind of new format. Okay, it's not so trivial. So it simply says like, uh, uh, in one file what was changed. I think it's a little bit more complicated than the previous uh, differences. And here you can see like um, uh, print hello was removed, okay, in red color. And in green you can see that this new line has been added. So that's how you know uh, what exactly has been changed in your project from the last uh, commit, okay, which was in the repository, basically comparing your workspace uh, with the repository you already have. Awesome, so I think this is good for this video and let's proceed to the next one. Okay, so now let's go and simply commit these previous changes uh, that we've just made, okay. So we modify the goodnight and the hello world.py files. And let's say, I don't know um, uh, what will be the associated message. Let's use something like extended, extended um, functionality of goodnight and hello world. Okay. 
So this will be like our commit message, press on OK. And there you go, we created the third revision in our project using the SVM. Awesome. <clears throat> All right, so press OK. And yeah, basically, let's check it out. OK, so what should we do also right now? So I think that one of the things that we should consider doing is to use maybe to use branch. OK, so branch, let's create a new branch. So repository to path. OK, OK, OK. So la la la. Where it is, okay, so <clears throat> this is our uh, working uh, copy, okay? The, this is our working copy. This is our destination URL, okay, destination path. And what we want to do is to press OK. And basically, you will see that you get this message already exists. So we want to create additional branch and it has to have like a different name. So let's create a uh, two path. OK, so it will be like, uh, let's say, branch, uh, I don't know, one. OK, so it will be under this directory also under branch. OK, you will see that a new branch will be created. So press OK. And now basically everything will be pretty much created. So your working copy uh, remains on the previous path. OK, on the previous path, if you want your next changes to be committed to the copy or branch, you have to that you just created, then you need to switch your working copy over the new URL. OK, so branches are uh, in SVN work a little bit or better say quite differently than how they work with other uh, version control systems such as Git. OK, so uh, use the switch command to do that. So currently we are at uh, we will be at our working copy. And if we want to move to the new URL, the new uh, branch that we created, then we simply have to switch command to do that. So let's go here and let's see Tortoise uh, SVN. And now let's search for this switch command. So uh, switch from here to path to this path. OK, so uh, basically, yeah. OK, so let's go and press on. Uh, OK, no problem. Working copy completed. And now basically, uh, as far as we are good enough for that, let us see what, what's going on right here. OK, so project repository. OK, no problems in here and everything seems to be working also correctly here. So let's take a look at it. Let's take a look. Show log. OK, so uh, what's going on here? What's that? Extended functionality. So actions modified. No problems. No problem. No problem. Everything seems to be working correctly. Let me see. Um, mm -hmm -hmm. Let me see. Let me see. Here is the branch. OK, so <clears throat> currently you can see that we are on branch one. And if we would like to uh, make some modifications to the file. OK, so let's say this will be like modifying just the hello world file. So let's edit it with notepad. Click on it. And let's see this notepad come here. So let's add some nice message. OK. Hello, beautiful uh, and fantastic world. And let's add this uh, kind of another print. This message is printed out from branch one. OK, so we assume that this information should be only only on branch one and not on the previous uh, point that we started. So this message is printed out. No problem. Awesome. So let's go right here and let's say uh, check for modifications. Let's see what has been modified. You can see that this hello world.py file has been modified. And <clears throat> now what we have to like to do is simply to use the add command. So add, right? Oh, not the add, but basically just the commit, SVN commit. And we see that 
we are going to commit these changes to branch one, okay, and not to our, uh, let's say, um, main repository part that we had like in the previous commits, okay, we had like to commit here. But now we work with this branch right here that we just created. So let's make this message and let's go like this. So um, uh, first commit to branch number one. Okay, that's what I want to do. And what we commit is the changes in the new uh, content of this hello world.py file. So press OK. And there you go, committing transactions where they are committed, everything seems to be working correctly. So uh, commit file, awesome. And now if we are going to take a look at this hello world project, okay, let's get into it, hello world, edit it and see what it contains, we can basically see that it contains the previous message that we just created, this message is printed out from branch one. Awesome. So let's close it up. Okay, let's close it here. Okay. And now what I want us to do is simply go back to our previous branch. Okay, so switch. And let's go to path. Um, switch from this one. Okay, what's going on? One sec, one second. So source URL. Okay, okay, okay. So um, <laughs> branch one. No, I don't want it. I want it like this. Okay, so uh, now what I'm going to do is also open up this file and take a look at it. Okay, and what you will see guys is very strange. The previous line that we had like print um, uh, the second print that was there like print I'm from branch number one is seems to be simply gone. And that's very strange, right? If we are not well familiar with the branches. But what happened is very simple. It's very simple and it's very intuitive. Because you can see here, okay, here is the hello world.py. And currently, currently, we are at the main branch that we start with. Okay, so you can see also now, like if you go to show log, no, not show log, but uh, okay, so yeah, so even if you go to show log, so the changes made to hello world.py were made to this branch one path, okay, to this branch one. But Basically, uh, the previous file, the last one file that was created like in, um, in the main branch is simply was this file. So what I want to say is this thing. Okay, so let's see check for modifications. Okay, so <clears throat> what I want to say is the following. We have a, a version of this file under this, uh, let's say, main branch that we created. Okay, so this file is uh, of this content. And we have created a totally different branch. Okay, that uh, simply if we go back to it to branch number one by using the switch command, where is it switch, and we go like branch one, switch to this branch. And we will see like that. Uh, if we come here to this file and edit it, you will see that it contains a totally different like uh, a totally different um, content, okay, with another content. And the reason of why you even should consider using branches, okay, it's basically something that we can leave for a totally different video. And to discuss it more details, okay, like to work on new features and new things and keeping track of bugs. And I, I don't know, there is a lot of things we can do. But I just wanted you to be introduced and to be a little bit at least familiar with the branches concept using SVN. So I hope I've done it successfully. Okay. And now let me know what you think of this so far. And thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you next time. Alrighty, welcome back beautiful people. And in this video, what I'm going to show you is basically how we can continue from our previous development using the uh, previous branch. Okay. 
and the changes that we've done here okay I don't know let's add also uh, another change done to good night okay have a good night and instead of a smiley we have like uh, these uh, characters so um, and also we add like a comment like um, uh, file was fixed I don't know okay something like that just 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 an idea okay currently I just want to remind you guys we are at the branch one branch okay and what I want us to do now is simply to like to go here to the project okay and to right click on it and go here and say let's say let's first of all commit these changes okay so um, um, modified uh, good night uh, I don't know and uh, uh, on branch one okay that it will be like more obvious okay you can see also that the commit is going to be made to this branch one so press on OK sending content okay everything is correcting correct awesome now right click on it and what we are going to see is how we can basically use this merge operation to merge between the two previous branches that we have but to make this merge even a little bit more interesting what I want us to do is simply to go back to the previous uh, to the previous file okay to the previous branch so let's go like switch and go to the previous branch and now in the previous branch I, we can see that this good night file okay uh, let's just close it here okay no and uh, of course okay so you can see that uh, basically we have like these two files okay at the the main branch and also one thing that I wanted to like to uh, to have your attention on is basically when we have this branch right here okay so these files are related to this path hello world project and also this branch one has the other files that you can work on so what am I saying exactly when you here uh, at the hello world you can see that if you take a look at this good night file you will see that this file does not have the previous changes made to inside of this branch okay and if you go here to branch one and you will check out this um, content you will see that it's totally different content okay so here is this branch one here is the main things that you are working on and if you simply will on where it is uh, switch if you will go to branch one then in this case what you will see is that uh, it seems that the previous changes of um, uh, of the main branch that was there right before the changes were made like to this kind of file are kind of uh, are kind of uh, transparent okay you cannot see them so what we are going to do now is to go back again and move on switch to our main branch not on to branch one okay so now you can see good night and py on branch and the second branch and now what I'm going also to do is simply here to create additional file I don't know let's call it um, readme.txt and this file is going to be very simple it's going to be hi I'm let's say I'm from the main branch thank you okay so this file is now saved and now what I want us to do is simply to take the changes from branch one and to take the files from here and see if we can kind of merge these changes okay so there were changes done there and there is a change like this readme for example that was done here let's see what ha will happen if we will try to use this merge operation so if we will take this directory of the project right click on it go to tortoise svn and click on the merge then what we are going to get is basically two options right here okay two options that we have to choose from 
The first option is the merge a range of revisions. And the second one is merge two different trees. And meanwhile, you can read about the differences. We are not going to get into the depth of the differences between them and what mainly one is used uh, over the other. But basically, we are simply going to choose here the second merge option, the merge two different trees. Okay, so this method covers the case when you want to merge the differences, okay, that we've just made of two different branches of our given branches on the working copy, uh, which is can can be considered also as the main branch, but I like to call it uh, like the working copy. But yeah, you know, basically, forget what I said right now, we are simply going to merge these two things. Okay, so press on next. And here, um, in the from URL, what we should do is to specify the branch to which we want to merge. Okay, so for example, uh, if we have like this branch, okay, uh, we have two branches, this is the first one. And the second one is with the path of branch one. And we want to take like, um, and we want to take the changes from, okay, from branch uh, one, okay, and merge them into the current branch, which is this one, then in this case, in the from URL, okay, we will simply leave it as is, okay. And in, uh, in the to URL, okay, we are going simply to specify here, branch one. Okay, now we are going to press on next. And let's hit the merge. Okay, so delete it, delete it. Okay, no problem. And let's see now that we are on kind of the main, right? This is our main branch in this example. If we will check out, we'll also see it right here. So what we will be able to see is also that this good night file was also updated. And this hello world was also updated, right? And the readme still remains with the message that was currently in this given branch. So what we've done is we've taken the branch uh, one, all of its information and basically merged it together with this current branch. Okay, so this is maybe useful, for example, if you have been uh, testing out some features, okay, created some new branch for features, testing it out. And then once the tests are complete, you simply merge them back to your like main line of development. So that's one usage. And yeah, I think that's enough for this video. Let's see if there is something else we um, may cover up right now. Um, no, I think that for this video, uh, we pretty much covered everything that we need.